George, and we are live on Game Changers with Vicki Abelson. Our guest tonight is Marcus Eaton. Woo! Yeah. Woo! Marcus, right. earn your money okay, here. Here we go. Here we go. Thank you, you. Play like one, and 
there's so many influences that I got there. Like yeah. I, I hear a little Sting, I hear mm-hmm. Ed Sheeran, I hear John May. I like hear all these things. Yeah. Um, but you're so you, and I love that song. So so where where can everybody get that song? Um, you can. I f- want that song. Yeah, you can find it on Spotify, iTunes. What's it uh, called? It's called Better Way. And. And actually, it's sort of the title track of my last album, which was, uh, the, the album was called Versions of the Truth, okay. so the, the title comes from that track. I love so, the title. Um, yeah. It's very provocative, because yeah. Versions of the Truth is what I would say about every man I've ever spoken to. The yeah. Versions of the Truth. Was that love-based? No, actually, it's politics. Ooh. You know, two versions of the truth lead you astray, you know, and it's mm-hmm. about the two different, you know... Uh, Two different stories that you're hearing all the time. You know, you watch the media, and it's like two, the same event can happen, but there, where is the truth? You know, somebody's always telling you. Their, I know their that the idiot the in chief is not telling it. No, ever definitely not. His definitely version not. of the truth is never the truth. No. Um, and I just no. want to say, um, I, I'm a little before. This is Yom Kippur. It's the highest holy day. I am, <laughs> yeah. a, a, I am a Hebrew, and okay. I am breaking all Jewish tradition. But I am having. Marcus I made you. me the best coffee yeah. and I don't know if you can see it here but it is in a little skull and yeah. it is delectable that that is really good coffee it's really I'm good I'm going to give a shout out Cafe Lux that, that is the best those are the best beans I've ever had it is really fine roasted in LA and he, Marcus has an incredible espresso machine in, in the mm-hmm. other room and it is <laughs> very I'm going to be flying tonight um, and I just saw my friend Ricky Bird is on Ricky um, oh. you know Ricky? no Ricky, uh, guitarist Joan Jett and the Blackhearts in the Rock and Roll oh, Hall of Fame. Wow. Watching, okay, you, you're, Marcus did some strumming at Jeff's show that was the fastest <laughs> strumming I have ever seen over the longest period of time. But I mean, even David Crosby says that you play like God on a good day, um, which is crazy. Yeah. But you, do, uh, it, so, and, and what kind of guitar is this? Because there's. This is actually, okay, this is a guitar that was handmade by a friend of mine named Roy McAllister. He's a friend of mine now, but uh, Crosby had one of these made for me. It's gorgeous. Yeah, it's, it's made by one luthier who now lives up in Gig Harbor, Washington. Wait, what's his name? Roy McAllister. Roy McAllister. But the cool part is, yeah. this is actually my signature model. So he's, he's selling these, and they have my name inside of the guitar. So this is a Marcus Eaton signature. Guitar? Stop! Yeah. This is the first one, so I mean, I didn't know he was going to do that. So this is all. This is an amazing guitar. It is gorgeous. It's a Pele mahogany, German spruce top. I mean, it's. it's it sounds phenomenal. Yeah. Did Did he have it made for you because you were admiring his? He or? had yes. He had one made for me. It wasn't this one. Mm-hmm. He had he had a, another one made for me. So I'm I'm very fortunate. But but the one that he made wasn't really for my style. It was for something a little bit different. And how he, so? Well, the, the way that he braces the tops mm-hmm. was made for somebody that does a lot of finger style, which I do. Uh-huh. But he looked at, looked at it, and then he saw me play, and we spent some time together. He was the guy that took me to Italy the first time. I went with Roy McAllister. And so after he spent like a week with me, he goes, you know, I would have built you a different guitar if I'd seen everything that you do, because you play a lot of different styles. And I said, yeah, I, I understand that. And he said, and by the way, you know, if I have to replace the top on that first guitar... We may have to do that in the future because the strings I use are heavier, so eventually uh-huh. things get out of whack. Wow! But anyway, that's a wonderful guitar. It was like the, one of the best gifts anybody could ever get, and Crosby totally surprised me by getting me that guitar. And I was like, oh my! I mean, I was just shocked. Like I'm imagining these so, are on the pricey side. Yeah, yeah. I mean, on the they, side. they they are, but but relatively speaking, um, they're they're Worth real. It. Oh, absolutely. And so, and you are an acoustic guitarist. I mean, that is your thing, right? Yeah, I mean, I play electric too, but I just there's something about acoustic that's just so real to me, and it's so percussive, and the sounds emanating from the guitar. You know, you're not playing through an amp. Right. This is the sound is coming right here. You know, it's it's analog. It's cool. So even when it's analog, <laughs> yeah. you're yeah. old school. Yeah. I, I don't know how old you are. I don't have a, a clue. Yeah, that's good. But, uh, so, and I I don't know that I'm. I said. I can ask you anything, and you said, yeah, but yeah. I don't think I'll ask you that. Okay, that's You can good. offer if you want. Yeah. But, I was born um, in the 80s. So. God damn, yeah. you know, yeah. Because sure, it was born in the 80s, <laughs> it wasn't, but it could have been. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, when you were playing with Jeff, everybody yeah. was electric except you. Yes. Pretty much, yeah. 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 So it adds, but it, it, it's interesting how that works. Because mm-hmm. you wouldn't think that would work necessarily with an electric band. No, not, I mean, it's kind of still rare to see somebody kind of sort of fronting a, a project with acoustic, but 
you know, I when I play live, when I'm not playing with those other guys, I mean, I'm doing a lot of looping stuff, and I'm doing a lot of percussion on the guitar and all of this. Mm. So that's that's the, the thing you kind of have to see, you know. But it, it makes sense, you know. Electric, I love electric. I love playing it, but it doesn't make sense to me solo. And I noticed you yeah. do the shake of the guitar at the end. Our friend Snuffy Walden oh, does yeah. that. Oh, yeah. the guitar yeah, that way. Yeah, and you get the... <laughs> <laughs> the a yeah. little bit. Yeah. That's very cool. Yeah, yeah, I love it all. Okay, so... So, all right, let's, I, I want to like a, a acknowledge, have a drink. I want to yeah. acknowledge that. Okay, so did you tell people that's oh. on, on Versions of the Truth? And people can get that on your website My as website. well as on CD Baby and all that stuff? Yeah, everywhere. Okay, so Mary, El Mary Ellen said, so awesome. I agree. Hi, Peg. Peg Thank and I you. saw you live. Peg, we saw Marcus live. You were with me. Yeah, I, um, remember. I remember. And Lorraine is here. Hi, Rick. Hey, Ricky. Um, Lashana Tova <laughs> to all my Jewish friends. Hi Linda. Hi Micro. Um, another nice session. Yeah. Hi Rick. Okay, Rick Smokey. By yeah. the way, if you ever need, um, you have a new CD coming out, right? Yeah, yeah. Have you already done the pressing and the liner notes and all that stuff? I have not. Well, some of it. I'll okay, show well, you. if you haven't done yeah. it all, yeah. My printer, Rick Smokey. Oh, okay. S Straight up serious. Okay. He's in he, Quick Impressions in Chicago. Oh, he made my tissue boxes. Nice. He made all my stuff, but he has never charged an artist to Whoa. do their printing. Oh my god! And he will. D no one ever takes Rick up on this, and he means it. So if you need liner wow. notes, if you need posters for anything, if you need oh anything you need, wow. Rick will take care of you, and it'll be his pleasure. And especially now yeah. that he's heard you play, he's gonna really wow. want. So that's awesome, Rick. Marcus is one degree from. He's a Jackson brand. He loves Jackson. Oh Brown, so yes. He loves Jeffrey Young, and Marcus plays nice. with Jeffrey. So there you nice. go, one degree away. Anyway, Rick will take care of you, and for all of you out there, he'll also take care of you. Rick Smokey, yeah. Quick Impressions of Chicago, and my hairdresser. I don't have my fuck off hairspray today. I'm sorry. Oh, I like New Cole Vanables, but it's called Fuck Off. I like what? this. I like this. Wait, what are you liking? I have to put my glasses on. Has he ever played Stairway to Heaven on that guitar? <laughs> I guess he is now. Lashana Tovapola. Hi, Christopher Cilio. Michael Jensen, Robert. Oh, Michael um, Jensen. What's up, Michael? Do you know Michael? Yes. Look at all the love you're getting. Hey, Michael. Um, and uh, hi, hi, everybody. Uh, I, I feel a little guilty as the Jew sitting here on Yom Kippur, <laughs> but it's over now. It's after 7.07, .07, so good yontif and all of that. Um, go blow the chauffeur. I already did. Thank you. No. So anyway, okay. So so Marcus. Yes. Let's let's know about you. So okay. Idaho. Yes. What Where's Idaho? How is it music in Idaho? Well, it's interesting. My dad is a singer songwriter. A singer songwriter. He, yeah, and he he's actually a pretty well known songwriter. He he wrote uh, one of the last hits that the Carpenters had. Stop. What? Yeah. All you get from love is a love song, and then he wrote a you know couple songs. Yeah. Wait wrote, a minute. Yeah, I wrote a song on... Um, on so your father's it? like my age or younger, probably. Oh my God, this is so yeah, sad. Yeah, He's like a youngin'. Okay. Um, but then he wrote um, another song called Ragdoll that's on the Art Gar Garfunkel Breakaway album and also on Glenn Cam Campbell's album. And, Wait a minute, how is yeah. he doing this from Idaho? Well, he, he came down here like in the 70s mm -hmm. and he got signed. He had a band called Fat Chance. And they were signed to a record deal, and then you know through that he met his a guy that was managing him for a long time, and they, was he an acoustic guitar? Is he an acoustic? Guitar yeah, I mean player? he's kind of like a jack of all trades, and he's a really great pianist, really oh. great singer, but really great songwriter and and guitarist, wow. and he's you know he's kind of plays it all. You know? And has he made his living as a as a musician? Yeah, yeah. So he in wrote, Idaho. Well, he was down here for a long time, and then okay. he wrote these songs, and mm -hmm. I mean that's back when like getting a hit song you could actually meant something. Yeah. And so that because yeah. it sold record vinyl, it's still selling. That's the thing. It's still on the oh. on the Carpenters' Greatest Hits album. So, That's crazy. Yeah. So he did really well, and so he's he's still doing his his thing. So I grew up around him, and then my his parents were opera singers, and then on my other side, on my mom's side, which is the Italian side of the family, my my grandfather was really musical, and so I mean, there's music everywhere in my family. So wow. I grew up around that, and so I, when did you did you start on on piano? Yeah, I started my my his my dad's mom. Mm -hmm. the, they were the opera singers, so I le started learning piano. But does your mother sing? Yeah, she sings for fun. You know, mm -hmm. she's kind of. I think she's sort of embarrassed to sing, mm -hmm. um, but she's she's still musical. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the thing. But um, both her parents are opera singers. 
No, that was my dad's. Oh wait, dad's uh, okay. Parents. I'm mom's parents. Up. Yeah, they. My my mom's dad was like he played accordion and he played guitar. And <laughs> Pete's <laughs> dad plays accordion. Really? First accordion soloist in the military at West. Wow. Uh, yeah, like serious accordion. Love it. Right. <laughs> that was my dad's first album or first first instrument. Excuse me, was accordion. Yeah. Yeah, because his parents were like, oh, I love Lawrence Welk, you know, so they. <laughs> They made him play the accordion, and he hated you're, you're it. You're getting so much love. Look at all this love you're getting. You're getting so much love. Well, that's, that's when you mentioned accordion. That's oh, what yeah. Got, People love accordion. People love accordion. Uh, yeah. So, so anyway, I grew up around all this music, and I just as soon as I played guitar, I mean, I I saw my dad playing guitar. I was like, that is the coolest shit I've ever seen in my life. You know, I just loved it. I don't. I, no, wait. Were you, you know, taking? Music lessons, or were you no. just you were just playing? No, I just and then I even just, piano. I, you just started playing. Yeah, my grandma was teaching me some like you mm -hmm. know somewhere over the rainbow and stuff like that. You know, some stuff that I wanted to learn and just some chords and stuff. But so wait, as, how old are you when you start? So I started anything? screwing with my dad's guitar, like opening the case and playing it when I was about eight. And my mom noticed that I was really into it, so they got me a guitar when I was nine, and like that was it. Like I just went, whoosh, and they got it for me for Christmas, and I just like ran off with it you know but it was weird because I already felt like I knew how to do it you know so, I was going to ask you about that yeah. so like pitch you've got that going on yeah. naturally and all yeah. that stuff yeah it's just one of these things that was kind of innate and it's kind of like I don't know I, so I mean, you grew up in the 80s what what uh, um, I interrupted you wait no, what were you going to no, say okay. no I just I just felt See, like this it is, was it's a, your fault yeah I'm going to be interrupting you just a like lot a, look a, at the dimple <laughs> It was like a soul level thing, you know, mm -hmm. where I just felt like, yeah, I've, I've played this before, and I just knew how to do it. In fact, I, I went to my dad, like, mm -hmm. literally later in the day, and I was getting really frustrated because mm -hmm. I couldn't do this finger-picking thing, and I started getting really frustrated, like, where I was going to cry, and my dad's like, hey, man, you know, this takes a while, and I was like, really? And he goes, yeah, this takes people years sometimes, and I was like, oh. I mean, I just thought it should be like really. Well, patience fast. isn't exactly a kid's best yeah. friend. No, but it just I, I. But I had the ability to play like I knew all these. Do you? Oh, okay, so let's talk about that for a second. Do mm -hmm. you believe in that? Because I do. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that um, we know things because we've done them before? Yeah, I do. I mm -hmm. think it's. I think it's a very good possibility. You mm -hmm. know, I think the soul can. You know, maybe come back and and uh, experience things. I think when. Um, we meet somebody and we feel like we've known them. Because mm -hmm. it's because we have. Yeah. And if we pick up yeah. an instrument and we feel like we know what we're doing, it's because yeah. we know what we're doing. I, I agree with you. I've, I've even talked with Crosby about that, um, about his, his sailing experience. And he told me that he just, like, he knew how to sail from the time he was a kid. He took a boat, went out, s sailed around Santa Barbara, and he was just like, yeah, I knew how to do it. I totally believe so, that. So, you know. Yeah. Because it, it there. doesn't make, because it doesn't make sense otherwise. No, there, I mean, there are musicians with, like, skill level that are, you know, 16 years old, and you're like, it would take 10 lifetimes to learn what you're doing, right? Th there are actually it's little kids, there are kids that are four years old that sit down at a piano yeah. and are virtuosos, and yeah. there, there is no possible explanation yeah. for that. Yeah. Okay, so you're, so you're a kid, so how are your academics if you're doing all of this music? Uh, I mean, I, I kind of... I kind of liked school. I mean, I liked to learn, That's good. but it was just, uh, I don't know. We grew up in this really small community and it just, it's, it's stifling after a while, you know, it was very what, what, religious, so, very I, okay, religious, so I was really, ask really, you. really LDS, you know, LDS. so it, Mormon, Mormon, very Mormon. We're in, on the side of the state we grew up on in okay. Idaho where we grew up. So, you know, you have that and that. Are you Mormon? No, 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 no. But we just, we kind of lived in the middle of nowhere, so we always did our own thing. I was really into, I, I haven't told you this, you don't know this, but I was really into falcons. So I used to train falcons. There was a falconer. And wow, was, did you see that yeah. movie? What was that movie with the falcon? The Falcon and the Snowman. Did you ever see that movie? Uh, yeah, it wasn't, yeah, well, I, Pat I, Metheny did a theme to that, I think, or something. Um, yeah, you should really see but that movie. I can't even remember. My Side of the Mountain was another one with the okay. falcon in it. I know nothing about falcons. And why, why were you into falcons? My dad was doing music for these films, and the guy that did the films. Uh, Wait, I want to. I want to show you this because this is oh, my. Yeah. This is my yeah. favorite bottle. Yeah. Is this showing in the shot? Oh yeah. Planet or plastic? I'm like. That's that from game. Sun Valley Film Festival, so they gave these out. It's really sweet. Yeah, it's very. Cool. Um, so my yeah, so my dad did these this music for these bird films, mm -hmm. and I met this guy who was like. The wait, wait, bird films. 
what was happening is this guy, I mean, it was kind of like Discovery Channel stuff. Oh, okay. Know? But they, mm-hmm. he was filming his own, he was had trained eagles and trained hawks and falcons. And he was working on a number of things. I mean, he did a lot of movies for Disney. Disney was filming these little things that you can find, like Ida the Offbeat Eagle. And I love, you yeah. are the first guest that like knows to look out at people. Everybody, we, we get into this, yeah. but thank you for doing that. <laughs> yeah. Look out at those people because you need to see yeah. this mm-hmm. this face. That, oh, so much love so, is happening. Hi, Christina Guzman. Yeah, so Ida the, yeah, he did these films like Ida the Offbeat Eagle, and, and he literally got a lot of birds delisted, or like they were killing them over in Europe a lot, and he stopped it from happening with his films. Wow. And he did all of this work. His name was Morley Nelson, so he was like, my my hero when I was a kid. So I met him when I was like five or six, and mm-hmm. I was just like, oh my god, birds! They're so <laughs> cool. So actually, now to, you know this is we're skipping around here. That's but, all right. But this is going full circle now because now I'm actually somewhere I put. Oh yeah, so I'm releasing this video in the next two weeks. It's the song called "Handed Down" with this company. I'm going to show this to you. It's called the Peregrine Fund. This I've been going here since I was nine. Wait, what? Yeah, and I've been into these, this, th- what they're doing, and they're a conservation group, and they, you know, the peregrine falcon was actually endangered. They personally were responsible for captive breeding peregrines, and they got them off of the endangered species list. I mean, this never happens. In this Wait, country. and you said that you've written something about it? Well, I wrote this song called Handed Down, which I is... think we have to hear it, yeah. or a piece of it, no? I can play, yeah, I can play it for yeah, you. come on, give um, us a taste of that, sure. so tell us about it. It's, it's an environmental song, and it's just about the world that we're handing to the next generation. Mm-hmm. And so I have a music video for it, and I've partnered with the Peregrine Fund. Wow. And they're, the thing is, they're conserving land all over the world, so they're working in the rainforests. And, you know, because a lot of these raptors that I love, mm-hmm. that's where their habitat is. You know, they've been doing this for 50 years. And where is this song going to be released? Uh, it'll for be, them? Or? It'll be, well, it's through my, my stuff. You'll just, if you follow me, you'll see it. But it'll be on Facebook and Instagram. Are they going to to use it? Yes. Yeah. Yep. I assume this isn't. Is this not on your new? It's on the new it's, album. It is on yeah, the new album. So it's coming out. So tell us a little bit about the new album. Oh man, the new album. It's it's cool. It's my first like uh, EP style thing. I, I don't really call it an EP. It's an album, but it's six songs. Okay. Uh, it's five new original songs mm-hmm. and one cover song, which I've never done on an album, but it was just, it, this was kind of serendipitous. My friend was telling me to do a cover of Fragile, the Sting song. And you so have I, very Sting-like influences. Yeah, too. well, it was really cool. So I, I did it and I was like, yes, it turned out so cool. But I, I wasn't really thinking about it for the album. I just was thinking about it for some film stuff. And it just turned out that it worked really perfectly, and I tagged it onto the end of the album. So there's three acoustic tracks, three band tracks, recorded it all here in this. All room. right, you're making my head explode because yeah. now I want to hear a little bit of both of those. Things. Well, let's see. Handed down. <clears throat> okay, this okay. is this is the song that is coming out soon. Handed down. Wow. 
Nice. You know, I love, mm. how did you get, you're very socially uh, responsible. Yeah. Did, did, did you, grow, <laughs> did you, were you born into that? Were your parents that way? Or um, what woke you up that way? Or were you God, always it, that way? I don't know. I, I think I've always been that way. It's weird. But I think also growing up where we didn't have a lot of influence, I, you know, it's a different time. You know, of course, What's going on politically in Idaho? Well, not much. You know, it's it's one of the reddest states in the in the union. Mm. But the thing is, like, we were pretty isolated even uh -huh. from that because we were in the middle of nowhere. Like, how many kids were in your school? Like, did you have oh, tiny? Yeah, tiny schools mm -hmm. in in the hundreds. You know, it was very small. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, we just grew up in the middle of nowhere, and so we we kind of just embraced being creative in all these different ways. I mean, we had two TV stations. And we were on an antenna, so they didn't always come in. So when so, we were kids, we were inventing things to do, and uh -huh. that's one of the reasons I was really into birds and falcons. And then, you know, once I got interested in that and I started reading about birds, I mean, I realized really early on that the environment was really important. Mm -hmm. And I, I realized that when I was a kid, that, you know, hmm. like what we have is the earth, and that's what we have, you know, and that that's always been with me, so... It's cool to be doing something completely full circle now. Like I'm really, I, I've wanted to do this for so long. So how did I'm you stuck. find them or them you? Well, I was just playing in Boise recently, and one of the women from the Peregrine Fund happened to be at my show, and my friend introduced me and said, "Hey, this is Amy. She works at the Peregrine Fund." I said, "Oh, that's awesome. I was thinking about contacting you guys because I have this song that." You know, I was interested in maybe working together, but I didn't know if you did any social media. Mm -hmm. She's like, yeah, we do. So what? what is it? And I told her. And, and so she's like, you got to come out to the Peregrine Fund the next day. So the next day I went out and just hung out with all these amazing birds. <laughs> so I went out, I was hanging with these, <laughs> these, these amazing, amazing owls. And he does and not mean eagles. women. He means yeah. the time. Birds. Like birds. These yeah. amazing birds. Yeah, I should be English. I need some birds <laughs> in my life. But anyway, it was just awesome. They have these new... You know, they have this new breeding project for these Aplomato falcons, which are beautiful. And this, I hung out with this African owl, and I fed the harpy eagle, which is one of the biggest eagles in the world. But the interest And you have no fear? No, no. I, I mean, I have a healthy fear. I think mm -hmm. you should, yeah. you know, especially of the big birds. Mm -hmm. But the thing is... Have you, like, had... Oh, yeah. That's what I was doing. Mm -hmm. But the crazy thing was that that week was when the Amazon news hit. When, when the Amazon was really burning, mm -hmm. when it hit, I was like, oh my God. You know, I was just so frustrated because I was like, shit, you know, what can we do? Mm -hmm. We clearly have, you know, you know, uh, politically, nobody's doing anything about mm -hmm. it. Obviously, this, this presidency does, does not care at all. In fact, they're probably making it worse. And mm -hmm. so it's really frustrating. And so I was just like, God, what can I do? You know, because the main thing is I don't want to focus on what somebody else is not doing. I want to try to do something myself. Be proactive, huh? So when that happened, I was just like, this is perfect. You know, they're having their 50th anniversary next year. They've been conserving land and doing this for 50 years. And they, they're a success story, you know. And so it's exciting. I'm really excited. I love it. All right, so now now, now a little taster for Adam. Oh, okay, let's see. One of my favorite states. Trudy know what you're up to? 
No. Because they should, because you I, are I want in, them to. Yes, the whole rainforest thing. Like, I can see this I, whole... I, it would be really cool if those two, the Rainforest Foundation and the, birds. And the Peregrine Fund mm-hmm. got together. And I'm I, thinking... I, I want that to happen. I would I'm really thinking love that, that, that uh, somebody who knows... Yeah, please. ...should be doing something them, about the... we got people out there that know the man, yeah, so... Please. ...that played with the man, so... That would be amazing. I mean, Jeff played with him, too, you know, which is really cool, but... Yeah, that would be a great connection That's because right. I'm, I'm telling you, like, if really right now everybody needs to get together. Who can do something, they need to do something. Well, right, the first thing we need to do is impeach somebody. That's the first thing we want on our agenda is lock them yeah. up, as Peter Onorani would say. Just lock him up. Crystal, okay, so Crystal it. is madly in love with you. She was uh, she was begging me Hello, to, like, Daddy. tell Pete to take the day <laughs> off so that she could sit in tonight yeah, behind the says, camera. She says, Hello, Daddy. <laughs> oh, boy. To but you. She, will, she will be at Women Who Write. Um, Marcus will be live in the living room um, on October 29th for Women Who Write, and he will be singing for us live. And Crystal, yeah. you'll be able to touch him and take a picture with if he well, lets you. <laughs> touch. I don't know. You'll be able to take a picture with him and, and hear him sing live, and you can swoon in person. Oh, boy. Um, uh, okay, so. It's more exciting. Than <laughs> it's, there'll be, there's going to be a, a house full, filled with of women. Could be. And, uh, you may need a bodyguard for you, that. You might know. need a bodyguard for that. And uh, and I'm going to be 64 that day, which oh, is wow. so fucking happy freaky. Birthday. Thank you. you. awesome. You'll be able to wish me happy birthday yeah. live and in person. Yeah. 64 is beyond the trippiest thing in the world. You know, like I remember hearing that song when I was less than your age. And yeah. That's pretty weird. That's to cool, be, though. To be getting that shit. Good for you. So, um, okay, so... Mm-hmm. So you're in Idaho. You're yeah. you're becoming your birds, your music. Yeah. Yeah. How the hell do you get out of Idaho? Well, we I started playing with this really amazing drummer when I was like 16, and we just kind of found okay, each wait, other. Okay, wait, stop. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm gonna interrupt you. Yeah. What's your first band? That was my that, first. Okay, band. so you're like yeah. a teenager. Yeah. And I was you know super into Hendrix and just playing mm-hmm. a lot of a lot of electric and just wanted to form a band. You know. So I found this drummer, and he was really exceptionally good. And so we started playing together, and we were just like, dude, this is awesome. We were a duo. Well, so a du- just me, wait a minute. Yeah, it was just me and a drummer. Yeah. What? We want, and we did eventually like have a bassist every once in a while, but we just, it was so badass, and we called it. Like what kind of drum? Like a kit? Like a whole? Oh, yeah, like big kit, roto toms, and like three toms. And an and, acoustic guitar? Uh, I was playing a, a lot of electric, I because at the time... You know, I, I wanted to play acoustic live, but you know, it was one of these things that was just trying to find the right acoustic with the pickup at that time. It was really difficult. It was very difficult. It's a long story, but technology has definitely progressed. So now, what kind of music is this? We called ourselves, I mean, it's not, it's crazy, but I mean, it's always been an extension of me. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's been similar. It's like really percussive and really rhythmic and cool. And well, you must have been doing covers. You weren't doing Yeah, that. we were doing covers. So, we like, what were, were you doing? Like, Rusted Root. Like, <laughs> that song yeah it's, that's one of the rusted root ones we were doing some Dave Matthews stuff and, and you we got to like, open for Dave Matthews we were doing Dancing Nancy yeah um, so how weird was that well we'll get to that when we when we get up there yeah so, so we started playing out and we started where are playing, you playing out in Idaho we played bars we played the first national bar in, so wait a minute you're Pocatello. too young to be in a bar yeah but you're playing in bars. Yeah, but we were playing there. We were making money. It was awesome. Uh, <laughs> we, we started playing the Bistro, which is another gig in town. Mm-hmm. And uh, we just started playing around. And we started getting this name. And anyway. What the, are you called? ESP. Because we just we had these mind melts, you know. We just be like <laughs> doing all this rhythmic stuff together. And we had business cards. It was amazing. <laughs> so we, uh, we started playing out. And interestingly enough, like we, I had some issues with that drummer. So you know bands always do do that and you know you're you're young you're going through your egoic bullshit you know mm-hmm. anyway so we kind of parted ways and he came back parted ways came back but he came back and then we actually got signed with it was him and As two other duo. guys we we formed again in okay. Boise we moved to the other side of the state mm-hmm. you know the actual city the one <laughs> city in Idaho <laughs> so mm-hmm. We moved over there. We got back together, and I was just, you know, like, dude, we got some, we got something real special, bro. We got to We got to encourage this dude, you know. And he's like, yeah, totally, man, you know. So we we get together. Find, we found this really amazing bassist and a sax player, oh. and we got signed with that band. 
we started getting this really big following in Idaho. Like, what kind of original music are you doing back then? It's kind of like, I mean, we got comparisons to like, of course, like the Dave Matthews thing was mm -hmm. pretty big, but it's, it's because I was playing a lot of acoustic, also mm -hmm. a lot of electric, but it was fronted by acoustic, very rhythmic, really amazing drummer, like DMB, mm -hmm. and also a sax player like those guys. But it was also like Bring On The Night, like the Sting Band, mm -hmm. you know, that's what it was like. It was like a fusion band. And we were doing some pretty pretty sophisticated stuff but we had some some songs and uh, that were really kind of pop oriented of course and we started touring around the Northwest and long story short because it is a long story but mm -hmm. these guys from LA found us they came up and we got signed to MCA we were on Universal so they released this album what year is this that you get signed that was 2002 mm -hmm. and then we released our album in 2003 and we had a really good booking agent for a while so a lot of the really good opening jobs came from that agent. That was awesome. Like I played with Victor Wooten. That was our first tour. Have you ever seen Victor Wooten? Play? I have not. Oh my god. Do you know who Victor Wooten is? No. Victor Wooten is like the baddest bassist ever. Oh. You know, and he was in Bela Fleck and the Fleck Tones. Oh, yeah. Bela Fleck. Bela Fleck is like the most incredible banjo player ever. So he was playing in, in uh, Bela's band. Mm -hmm. And oh my god, it was just wicked. So we knew who he was and we were like, oh my god, we get to play with Victor Wooten. I and mean, he's just bad ass it's you can't even describe it it's so good so we played with him and we played with train we opened for train and that was like the drops of jupiter tour yeah and we, and we were huge yeah we were ruling we were just <laughs> ruling it was awesome so we did a lot of amazing shows we did a whole series of uh shows at the fox theater in boulder which is like one of the best venues in the country mm -hmm. they did a whole uh, you know thing with us we came down here and played like the house of blues the Foundation Room, we did a number of things. We were on Mark and Brian. That was a huge show for us. I bet there. you sold a lot after we Mark did. and Brian. We did. Oh, we hell yeah. We sold 300 CDs, like, mm -hmm. right there. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. So, hopefully the best is still yet to come, but that was that was a good time. That was pretty good. So, so <laughs> yeah. how long did that last? That lasted, a, you know, three years probably. Mm -hmm. 2002. We, well, you know, 2001, two, three, into part of four so it was like a five year situation and then the band I think they honestly I think that they just got frustrated that we weren't further along because of course you know when you're young you can't see into the future and you don't know how good it actually is you know because mm -hmm. we could have kept going for a long time you know and probably kept building mm -hmm. but they were just like dude no it hasn't happened yet bro and you know we want to do other things and mainly the drummer kind of put the kibosh on it you know has he gone on to bigger and better things? Uh, I mean, he's he's still playing. You know, he's down in Nashville. He's mm -hmm. doing other things. You know, mm -hmm. um, but you know, everybody has to do what they feel is right for themselves. So, Absolutely. You know, so he did that, and actually, it was a good thing for me because it developed my solo thing, and that's what I've been doing ever since. And then that's how all these other things happen. So you know. Okay, so yeah. so the band breaks up. You're still. Yeah very young mm -hmm. um, what's the next thing? so you've been writing songs all through through this yes well you did mm -hmm. you guys write together or did you write your own we we did have some writing together but mm -hmm. mainly it was just me doing the mm -hmm. doing the writing and it wasn't you know because I didn't like writing with them we, we tried mm -hmm. different incarnations but mm -hmm. it was just it was my stuff you know mm -hmm. so it was just that. so so you're making a living as a musician yeah I was in did I, you ever yeah. have to do anything else I was working in a record store. I was working at Barnes and Noble for a while, which really sucked. That was for a those of you that are young. <laughs> Barnes and Noble were bookstores. There yeah. used to be these stores yeah. where you could go and buy books back in the olden days. You know what a book is? <laughs> yeah. No. So we. I, I was working at Barnes and Noble. I worked at a record store. I worked at a guitar shop, which mm -hmm. was a really good gig for me uh, because get things cheap. Yeah, and you know, people coming through town. You never know oh. who was going to be there. Victor Wooten came through. Mm -hmm. Before I opened for him. Oh, nice. And I took a master class, and I was just like, holy shit, he's so amazing. <laughs> and so I just, I learned all these things from him. So he's like, actually one of my top guitar influences, wow. this guy. I mean, he I does, have to he, find, I have to get schooled. I don't know does, how he is. Oh, he just does the crazy, I mean, he does these things like, like he does these slap things. Like, um, slap bass is my favorite this, thing. This is something. All right, this is his thing. things that you can't, you don't know what's happening. He's, he's like a magician, nice. so I mean, I, I 
learned all of this stuff and like adapted it to the guitar and I was just like oh you know then we got to open the phone so that was a good gig but anyway I just I have to give a shout out to my two favorite slap bass players which is Kenny Aronson oh yeah um, and and Charles Torres who plays with Rick Derringer those those both those guys are wicked slap bass players they know who Victor is I'm sure they do sure um, He's so, okay, so, uh, okay, so so you're out on your own. Yeah. You're writing songs. Are you still yeah. making a living as a musician out on your yeah, own? Yeah, I mean, it's always been, you know, it's always been like, like this. Yeah. I was, okay, so I was still in Idaho. Mm-hmm. It was about 2004. I came down here, recorded an album. Mm-hmm. And it's a lo- another long story. I had some bad luck with some of the tracks because they were on an analog board and they lost some of my tracks. So that was a, that was a real bummer, but mm-hmm. I went ended up going back and f- basically re-recording that album, which turned out to be this album called Story of Now. I've heard some of it. Yeah. yeah, and so that album came out, and I just continued to tour, and I've toured a lot with this guy named Tim Reynolds. Tim Reynolds is this unbelievable guitarist that plays with Dave Matthews. That's how people know him. Mm-hmm. But he's just like, ext- oh my God! I mean, on the level of guitar players, he's just he's way up there you know Mm -hmm. and one of my main influences and so another kind of like hero was like oh my god if I could ever play with Tim and I got to do it a lot and tour with him and he was one of the people that okay so wait what does touring look like at At that time it it involves having a suburban okay um, getting a couple (laughs) friends together to help you I had a sound Mm -hmm. man and myself Mm -hmm. at least Mm -hmm. and also Usually, maybe another person that would help me, like with merch and selling CDs, mm-hmm. but at least at least a sound man that would help me drive, and we would just go. You know, we'd book. Basically, Tim would book something, and I'd say, "Hey, man, can I hop on this tour with you?" And they were, they're one of the few people that's been kind enough to just be like, "Yeah," and and we will and we will help facilitate that, and we're going to try to get you on as many dates as we can. And so, can, what kind of venues are you playing at that? Point? Um, playing like how many seats and stuff. Like oh, clubs, clubs, uh, clubs, and theaters. Like mm-hmm. you know, they could be maybe 400, 500 seats at the mm-hmm. most. Mm-hmm. And he's. I did a lot of things because I did some with his band, and then I I did a lot with him solo. So the like the solo ones were really cool. You mm-hmm. know, we did a lot of that, and we started playing together on stage, which was another really amazing moment for me. But you know, like two or three weeks of solid touring. Mm-hmm. And it's really helpful, you know, and it really bolsters your, your, the way you feel about yourself too, because we need that, you know, Mm -hmm. because a lot of times you feel like people are ignoring what you're doing. And (laughs) so it's good to be out there playing in front of people, you know, and his, and his audience clearly, I mean, they're open-minded, you know, they love a lot, a lot of times at first they were like people that really love Dave Matthews. And so you get a lot of those people in the audience, but Mm -hmm. he's, he's got a different, he's a totally different person and, but, but they're accepting of other music you know the people that are going to see him are a little bit more adventurous Mm -hmm. so that was always good Mm -hmm. that was always good you know get out there and do some guitar fireworks and people were like yeah it's awesome you know so yeah yeah so okay so so you're doing that for a while yeah and you're are you prolific you're writing 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 yeah Mm -hmm. and at the time you know it wasn't like you could go into the studio because it was too expensive Mm -hmm. so you kind of you'd come up with a big group of songs and you just keep playing them live and then eventually you know you try to find the money to record and so I've been really lucky that way because I've had a couple people that have invested in you know in my career Mm -hmm. but probably the biggest thing that happened was I met this guy named Norm and his name is Norm Waite and he came to a gig of Tim Reynolds and so this brings me to the current. Full circle. Full, full circle. <laughs> Norm came to his show. It was opening for Tim Reynolds. It was at the Belly Up in Aspen, Colorado. He loved the show. And he said, hey, man, you know, when you're, uh, are you going to be opening for Dave Matthews and Tim Reynolds at the Santa Barbara Bowl? And I was just like, dude, I would love to. That's my dream gig. He's like, well, I'm going to try to make that happen for you. And I was like, oh, okay. Because you know, in Aspen, you think like everybody's a little bit crazy, you know. <laughs> And he he did it. He actually because wow. he was on the board, and so he got them. And then I ended up you know going through the DMB management. And they said, well, we can't have an opener because we have a curfew. But he did it, you know. So he introduced himself and he invited me to come play his Christmas party. And the, it was really strange. I got a message from his girlfriend, and I was living in Seattle. I moved to Seattle for mm-hmm. a couple years, and she said we really love your set. Norm uh, would really love you to play his Christmas party and. 
don't worry about transportation. He'll send a jet to pick you up. And I was like, oh, that's interesting, you know. And it happened. So I thought, well, yeah, I've, I've, I've made it now. But anyway, so I go out there, play this Christmas party. And is it all like the cool people in Aspen? No, no, oh. it was it was a company party okay. for him, and I didn't mm-hmm. really know that much about what he did. Well, mm-hmm. as it turns out, he and his brother co-founded Gateway Computers, and it I was like, oh, okay, you're Gateway, you're the one of the Gateway guys, and he just said, man, and he's so into music, he's so into it, and he goes, I need to introduce you to my friend David Crosby, and it was just one of these, you know, amazing, serendipitous things, and I wow. flew back and. He put it in, and you know, we've been friends ever since. And he's like one of the most wonderful people I've ever met in my life, ever. And he's completely, I mean. Is he philanthropic? Oh, beyond. I could I mean, just get that. Yeah, vibe. and yeah. he's beyond. I mean, he's, mm-hmm. he's like one of these people that, I, he's the most generous person I think I've ever met, which is, which is somebody I really look up to. Because, you know, if, you're, if you have the ability to do that, there's a lot of people that have the ability to do that and, and don't. don't do that. Okay? Correct. So that, yes. that's it. Mm-hmm. Anyway, he said, I need to introduce you to Crosby. Put a dinner together for us. I met Crosby, and it was crazy because we totally hit it off. Okay, so wait, what was yeah. the intention, the original intention to get he you just together? He just said, hey, this." he start, started sending emails, and he said, you need to check this guy out. I saw him play opening for Tim Reynolds in Aspen. You mm-hmm. just need to hear him. And how long ago was this? This was like in 2009, probably. Okay, so like nine. 10 years ago? Yeah, mm-hmm. and he goes, uh, he's, I remember the first email, and Crosby goes, oh, you say this guy's just starting out, but you don't get that way from just starting out. He's been playing a long time. I mean, that guy's, you know, he's a badass guitarist. Like, that was the first email. And at the time, I, you know, I'm pretty young. I didn't really realize, I know Crosby, Stills, and Nash, but I didn't know what they'd done. I don't know much about that era, you know, okay. at the time. So I was Let, like, let's David pause Crosby. This, let's pause yeah. a second. Okay. So what was the music that you were listening to besides Dave Matthews and stuff? What? I was listening to a lot of, uh, I was listening to Tim Reynolds a lot, mm-hmm. and he has a bunch of solo albums. I was listening to a lot of African and world music that was because I was working at this record store, so I'd listen to everything. I'd just put stuff on the player. I was listening to a really a lot, like a lot of eclectic stuff, like Nine Inch Nails I was really mm-hmm. into for a while. Um, but, but mostly like getting back into the, some of the singer-songwriter stuff. I was really into like. that guy. Oh, let me think. Um, I, well, I got really into Bob Marley for a while. I, okay. know, I know people don't think like he's a singer-songwriter, but that was I like do. some of the most powerful music mm-hmm. ever. Obviously, I was really into Hendrix. I was really into Stevie Ray Vaughan mm-hmm. for a while. I started getting, I was really into the Spin Doctors. They were popular, but mm-hmm. that was a badass band. I don't give I a shit what doctors. anybody says. That band... Fucking ruled. I love yes, them. I they, love they, them. They're the shit. Mm-hmm. They're the shit. And then I got into. Um, That's my Facebook friend. We actually had a conversation. A spin years doctor. Ago. Yeah. Oh, what's uh, what's his name? Um, Chris. Chris. Yeah. yeah. He's, they're badass. So man. now, so, so then I saw that you blues oh, traveler. Had, all the horde tour. All the horde yeah. tour stuff. How did happening. you uh, open for Dylan? Oh, okay. Well, that was with the band. The band that I was talking about that was signed was called The Lobby. Marcus Eaton and The Lobby. Okay. We started. It's kind of like the weekend. Yeah, it was kind. Of, originally, it was kind of like the idea was that I, I pretty much thought that the band was going to change around. So I was just like, if I just have a band called the Lobby, like the E Street Band, mm-hmm. you know, you can change the members. That's kind of what it w- was mm-hmm. at the beginning, but it turned out to be a permanent band. That was just the way it worked out. But what happened was we started opening all these shows around Idaho and around the Northwest, mm-hmm. and people knew that we could dr- have a draw. Mm-hmm. Because we were pulling like between 500 and 1,000 people at all these gigs. And so it was a really big Sweet. deal. Yeah. And we had, I mean, we were loving life. It was amazing. And so the promoter in Idaho, it was awesome. My brother ran into him <laughs> and he, you know, he said, So what are you working on? I see that Bob Dylan's coming here. And he's like, Yeah, well, we're putting on a, another show that nobody knows about it in, in Sun Valley. And he said, well, You ought to have my brother open for it. And he goes, That's a good idea. I think I'll do that. And so we got a call. Hey, do you want to open for Bob Dylan? What, what year is this? Yeah, it was 2003. Okay, so now you're, t- you're talking about being into singer so I mean, yeah. were you did you know from Dylan? Oh yeah, I mean, did I, you have an I, appreciation I, of what you were walking yeah, into? Yeah, I mean, I I did, I did. I mean, I knew I knew how big of a deal it was because my you know my dad is a singer songwriter. Like my dad, 
is one of the best singer songwriters ever. I mean, he's like James Taylor, Bob Dylan. Jesus. Like he's he's a badass. So, so I'm just saying, like I grew up around a really high level. of What's your dad's name? Steve Eaton. Yeah. Okay. Steve so Eaton. can people find his stuff online? Yeah, you can mm-hmm. find his stuff online. He's got two. I, I'm we're my brother and I are, are pushing him to record a new album because he's got like he's probably better than ever. His voice is better than it's ever been, and it's amazing. But he needs to do a new production because you know. He's gone through. There's been a lot of eras since he released his la- his albums, and the albums that were released mm-hmm. in the '70s. I mean, it's awesome because it's like Lee Sklar, <laughs> Russ Kunkel, um, the immediate Steve, family, yeah, Steve Postelman. Yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly. Uh-huh. Steve Luthither. Wow. They're, they're all playing on my dad's album. Wow. So actually, another f- full circle thing that was really cool is on my album versions of the truth. Lee Sklar came over and played on three songs on that album. Because he knows my dad, That's and he crazy. was just like, "This is so cool." Mm-hmm. It was amazing. That's so, crazy. Yeah, it's like that. Living the dream. And is yeah. your dad really proud of you? I think so. Mm-hmm. I mean, we can ask him. He's maybe he's watching. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, um, I, Pete, I let us kidding. know if is I'm he on social kidding. media. Yeah, he'll if he, he'll see it. If so, my page, so Pete, let us know if um if uh, dad comes on the uh, okay. on the thing. So um. <laughs> Is his dad single? He's not single. No. He's not single. Crystal! (laughs) Crystal! She's just, she's, if she can't get the sun, she wants the, she wants the, hi John, hi Patrick. I like this thing where it says being a musician is not something you choose. I I totally agree with that. I actually think it chooses you. And so you just, you work with, you know, you work with that energy. It chooses you for sure. By the way, if you guys have questions for Marcus, Pete's going to be firing sure. those off in a bit. So uh, let us know if you have any questions. It's very thorough. I didn't um, know it was going to be so thorough. Yeah, but this is... This <coughs> it's is, awesome. This is... Uh, this is uh, yeah, this thank is you. This is Facebook A-game. Yeah, right. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, um, so okay, so, so now what's it like when you play that concert with Bob Dylan? It was, <clears throat> it was really interesting because it was like... Yes, you know, yes, the local people think you're important, but these guys don't even want to see you, you know, and so it was really funny because we had a great show, we had so much fun, and I mean, it's it's outdoor in front of the ski hill, it was gorgeous, about six, and like how many people? About 6,000, nice, 6,000 people, Uh everybody's stoked, and you know, so we we got up and played, it was killer, but so, are are the people ignoring, of the audience? No, no, they too. loved it. They're, they're they, the it. audience okay. was totally into it. Mm-hmm. Um, the interesting thing was they wouldn't let us use their soundboard. So they're like, you have to use our B soundboard. Okay, sure. Mm-hmm. So we did that. So that mm-hmm. was a kind of a whole thing. We had our own sound man. Mm-hmm. So they were just like, don't touch this, <laughs> but you can touch that. You know, <laughs> it was pretty interesting. And then uh, I remember this was the funniest part. We get done with the show. We get on the stage too, set up, and I, I go up to the sound. I mean, the guy's standing on the side of the stage, and I'm just like, you know, I'm young. I'm like, hey, man, you know where I can plug my pedal board in? He's just like, no, I don't fucking know where you can plug, plug your pedal board in. Fuck off, like this. I was like, okay. You know, I mean, this, is, this is the kind of like, they're, they're with the band, you know? I was right. like, okay. So we start setting up, and, you know, we're just kind of navigating this scene huge backstage and like all the catering set up and we're just like oh wow there's chocolate cake back here this is amazing and they've got fresh strawberries you know and we're just we're just like this is this is huge right so we start loading our stuff and i remember we had this huge tub like of my drummer's gear we start loading it off and some guy just goes set it down we're like what like we just opened so we kind of ignore him he's like no i'm talking to you man set that shit down i'm like okay and he's like, set it down right now. Okay, so we set it down. We go like this. And he's like, don't look at the artist. <laughs> and here comes Dylan and his band. And they're just like, oh, you know, doing God. this. And we're just like, oh, oh hi. We just opened for you, but you don't care. It's cool. We'll just stand over here. You know, they just didn't, they just, we're just like, just, wow. just fuck off. Just don't, you know, just told, don't interact. I've told this story yeah. before. Um, when Kenny Aronson was playing with Dylan. Yeah. He, they were recording one day and he told me to come to the studio because mm-hmm. Dylan was my god yeah. and he said come and I'll introduce you and so I came up in the elevator yeah. and he stopped me at the elevator and he said go home, not oh. today because okay. he, yeah. he was in one of those moods and he, he don't meet your hero sometimes yeah. right? yeah, so sure it was but one of those things. I've discovered it's, it's usually 
really it's usually not the artist usually it's the people around them yes and I, I, I actually true. went out and opened for Jewel for like three or four dates that mm-hmm. was interesting well how so uh, it was it was fun. She's amazing, and she's a really great storyteller. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was I, totally unexpected. I didn't mm-hmm. really know what to expect. It was her solo, and she told these great stories. Mm-hmm. But I was on the elevator, and you know, again, one of the guys was just like, "Dude, you need to get out of the elevator now." You know, <laughs> I was okay. All right, we're getting out. You know, and she comes down the hallway, and she's just like, "Will you chill?" That's what she said. "Will you chill?" These guys just opened, dumbass. Mm-hmm. That's what she said to the guy. You guys nice. just played, right? And I go, "Yeah." She's like, "How was it?" I was like. It was awesome, you know. It was great, and so she was just super sweet. Mm. Anyway, has anybody not been super sweet? Uh, yeah. I mean, there've been people. I, I'm not going to make you name them, but no. I mean, yeah, who's been? Who have you played open for that's been wonderful? Uh, been one wonderful? of the coolest people that I've opened for besides mm-hmm. Tim Reynolds was. Um, now that you're now that you're asking me, I'm mm-hmm. gonna. Just one second. I have okay. to. I have to access that random access memory. Oh, wait, I'm trying to. I have to see like um, who 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 I've said that you opened for. I know you opened for Seal recently, right? Did you? I played with Seal at an at an event in out in downtown, uh, in Hollywood. What and was that, that like? And, and Flea. That okay. was the band. It was it was amazing. Seal and Flea were in yeah. a band. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, that's for, wild. For the moment. And how was that? It was awesome. I love those guys. I mean, they're some of my some of my musical heroes. I mean. Seals badass, you know. I've always loved his stuff. So that great was cool. voice. Yeah, it was cool. Um, uh, no, but but who's the? He's uh, hang on. I'm just forgetting his name. He's one of the guitarists in the E Street Band. Um, Niles. Um, Nils. Nils. Nils Lofgren. Nils Lofgren. I played with him solo, mm-hmm. and he was like one of the f- very few people that is just. He's awesome. Like did he I just was, say Niles? Yeah, yeah, but that's cool. No, but, no, he, but came, I was close. he came back. He mm-hmm. came back to knocked on the dressing room door and was like, "Hey, man, great job. What's your name?" And that never ever happens ever. The other people that, that are so amazing nice. blues traveler always. They're just like, "So, dude, what's your name?" Okay, well, we're, we're gonna make sure we announce it to the audience. Nice. They they probably dropped you know my name three or four times. Oh, and that's it's really just, nice. It's just kind of going out of your way to mm-hmm. to show. But it's going out of your way, but. How far they go? I mean, it's just a lovely no. thing to do. It's being human. It's it, it's the nice thing. It's it's something that you can recognize when somebody's actually worked their way up, and they recognize that you're working your way up, and they mm-hmm. appreciate it mm-hmm. instead of like. Well, because ah, everybody's worked yeah. their way up. Yeah. At some point, everybody did. Yeah, but some people forget that. Yeah. You know, but it's cool. It was. I've, I've had pretty much good luck with people like that. You know, there's been a few, but I've forgotten them. You know. So, okay, so let's talk about David Crosby and how that yeah. whole relationship started and <laughs> yeah. developed and turned into a lot. Because yeah. you've recorded together, you've written together, you've toured with him, you composed yeah. the music for the document. We want to talk about your brother a little bit, too. Yeah, but absolutely. let's talk about David first. So Well, so we met, that was 2009. And he's, our, he's sober right, yeah. when you meet? Yeah, and, uh, and we just... I mean, it was funny because I actually I showed up early and he showed up early, and our the friend that introduced us was like on time, but we were both early, uh-huh. and I was on tour because mm-hmm. I, I didn't really have anything else to do, and he put this dinner together, so I went down to Santa Monica and I was I wasn't living in L.A. yet, mm-hmm. so we met at this this place in Santa Monica, and I said, hey, hey David, I'm Marcus, you know, and he's like, oh, nice to meet you, man. So, so I like your music. So he's already listened yeah. to what does he listen to? Story of Now. Okay. He's like, I really, I really like your tunes, man. Mm-hmm. So, what are you listening to? And I said, uh, right now I'm listening to Esperanza Spalding, and he's just like, Oh my God, isn't she fucking amazing? She's incredible, you know. And then we just totally hit it off, and we're talking about music, and so we that was like that was how we met, and then we had dinner. So wait, so what is he like? He's engaged. He's, he's friendly. Completely he's, engaged. He's, he's one. He's accessible. T- I mean, not ego. No, I mean, I had no expectations, but he. By totally, this time, are you schooled? Have you schooled yourself? Do you know who he is? Do you appreciate? Well, I know who he is, who he is but I but don't. I, but I'm not like a super super fan either. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know all the things he's done. I know mm-hmm. some of it, but mm-hmm. but that was a good thing. That turned out to be a good thing. For okay. Me because I think if I had known everything, I don't know that I could have been really mm-hmm. as, confident. as comfortable yeah mm-hmm. so anyway I just I started talking with him and, and we just totally hit it off I didn't expect that and he's totally lucid 
He's really into the same things. He's re- you know, he's into shit that matters. He's into the environment. Mm-hmm. He's really well read. He reads all the time. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's an, a very intelligent guy, one of the most intelligent people you can talk to. Mm-hmm. And so we really bonded immediately. It just wasn't it wasn't an issue. And so at the end of that meeting, he's like, hey, man, take my number. And I was like, really? And he's like, yeah, man, call me. Like, I want to hear, hear you play sometime. I want to get together and play. And I was like, okay, awesome, you know. And, and I, what is he doing at the time when you... At when the time, he was recording CSN album with Rick Rubin. <laughs> so, you know, so it was like, wow, you know. I, I just, I, it still kind of boggles my mind that this happened, you know, thinking about it in retrospect. Mm-hmm. So we tried to get together one time down here, but what happened was I found out he was coming through Idaho. And I was back in Idaho. I'd moved to Seattle. I moved back to Idaho for this girl that I fell in love with. I was going to say, why would you move back yeah, to Idaho? Yeah. Okay, that explains it. But it was, I was touring all the time, so it mm-hmm. wasn't like, you know, and, and again, like when you have a following somewhere, mm-hmm. you, you can do a lot. Yeah, you know? yeah, So yeah. It, was, it was nice. Mm-hmm. So anyway, at least at the time I thought it was nice. So, <laughs> so I went back there and I saw he was coming through town and I called him and I said, hey man, you know, you're coming through Boise. He's like, great. I'll be there early. I arrived the night before. I fly in. Let's have dinner and then let's play. So we have dinner. And we go up to his, his hotel room. And oh, and you haven't played together yet? No. Okay. And, and he's like, I have a guitar that you have to see. And he hands me this McAllister. And I was just like, whoa, shit. Where did you get this thing? You know, I was just like, oh, my God. He's like, you need to get one of those. You know, it's like, yeah, well, someday, you know. Anyway, I play him this song. I remember the song. It's called Smile. And he's just like, oh, my God. You Let's have a little taste of that. Oh, Smile's like a... So, yeah, so I, anyway, I played him that song. He's like, oh, you got to play for my son. So he called James, you know, because he was on the road. He Mm -hmm. said, James, come over here. So his son came over, and I played for him. And he was like, wow, that's really inspiring. And Crosby played me a song. And then it was like from that day on, it was like we were pals. He said, come out to the bus, man. Come hang with us tomorrow. I hung out with him, and we were just getting to know each other. And then I I didn't know what was going to happen. I just Mm -hmm. thought, okay. I said, so what are you doing next? He's like, I'm heading over to uh, Hyde Park to go open for Paul McCartney. I was just like, holy <laughs> shit, man. Are you serious? You know, I just could, I couldn't believe it. And then he you know, he gave me a shout out from the stage. He played uh, Deja Vu. And he's like, this is for my friend Marcus Eaton. Amazing singer, songwriter. You have to hear him. I was like, oh, my God. That could, is so Yeah, cool. I couldn't believe it. You know, I could not believe it. So anyway, so he left and I, I was like, didn't I, you know, I was at this point in my career where I, I'm still trying to move forward and mm-hmm. I'm trying to find somebody to release my album. Nobody's interested. And I wrote to him, hey, Crosby, I'm really looking for like maybe a manager or somebody that you can recommend. And he, I didn't hear back from him. And like a couple days later, he's like, hey, man, I'm getting ready to record a new album. And I'm, I'm wondering if you would like to come play guitar. And I'm like, uh, yeah, <laughs> yes, you know. <laughs> and it was one of those things where. I've had things fall through a lot. and mm-hmm. I mean, everybody that's everybody been in this has. business. Mm-hmm. That I didn't even tell anybody mm-hmm. because I just didn't want it to not happen. You know, I didn't Aww. want it. To, well, I didn't want to tell somebody and then mm-hmm. it doesn't happen. And then I'm just bummed out about it, you know. So I was just like, oh, wow. So we set it up and it was Halloween. I think it was 2009. It was on Halloween. And I was touring. I was on the East Coast. 
and I flew all the way across the country and James the son picked me up in Burbank and I went to his house and we started recording and then I called my friends dude <laughs> I'm a, I'm a cross piece, man. You know, like, I was... I'm like getting bloody now. Sorry. Um, anyway, I... Can I have one of those tissues over there? Sure. That, so, see? Wow, look at that. You see how handy they are. So, anyway, he um, picked me up from the airport, and then it was real. Then it was like, okay, we're working. And he sent me two tracks, mm -hmm. and I was just like, okay, we're in it now. And it was... It Amazing, and then and then it just developed. He's so like, you're playing guitar. Are you doing background vocals or not yet? We didn't know. We oh. didn't know. We laid down the guitar parts, mm -hmm. and I think they were just kind of testing the waters to mm -hmm. see how it would work. It worked really well. And then mm -hmm. Crosby's like, "We need to write something. We need to write something together." I have a really good feeling. So we did. Can you give us a taste of something? Well, one, together? one of the, yeah, one of the things. Oh, let's see if I can remember this. But this was the first song we recorded. This was like we didn't write this together, by the way. riffs and it's called the clearing mm -hmm. and I just remember learning that and it's this really cool outro you know it's it's really it's really progressive mm -hmm. and I realized like yeah we're really related musically on a progressive thing and he's into the same chords but he's using open tunings to get to the same places that I'm going like playing like you know he's, he's doing that with an open tuning and I'm, and I'm just doing it with my, with my fingers and so we, we really relate in a lot of ways. So anyway, one of these things was like, a, I don't know if I can remember it. This was something that, in particular mm -hmm. just oh, so great because it was something it was an idea that I had that I brought in didn't expect anything to happen you know and it just James went crazy on it and then Crosby just like wrote the words it was it was that was a moment that was a moment it was really cool so now yeah. when how does it start happening lyric uh, uh, vocally for you guys vocally um, you know he had heard my stuff and said alright well let's you know his son was like let's get you in on these on these vocals okay I jumped in there and it was just like oh yeah I mean just it was kind of like the excitement was building in the studio because it was organic mm -hmm. and you know they listened to my stuff and they they knew that I could do it mm -hmm. so I got in there and sang it and, all right let's stack that up I mean there's this amazing moment at the beginning of the album of that album that's called uh, what is the name of the song it's called uh, what's broken mm -hmm. the song that James wrote and they just stack these harmonies up, and it's like they lie, 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 you know, all to, to this really huge stack. And I mean, you know, I got to sing a lot of those parts. It's Crosby and me and James, and it was just like, oh my god, At that this was even point, actually, you, yeah. What? Oh, was I mean, I was just thinking it was even a lot of times more fun than playing guitar. I mean, I love playing guitar, but. To, to sing harmonies with Crosby was just so amazing. I'm thinking at this was, point your was, father is kind of just yeah like yeah. Really I, don't, I don't think he really doing. believed it until you know until he it came it. yeah because it took three years mm -hmm. so everyone's like oh when's mm -hmm. that gonna happen you know everybody's kind of like doubting you is mm -hmm. that ever gonna come out and I'm like it'll come out mm -hmm. it'll come out you know and then finally it did so that was like you know a little bit of touring he was in between he, now this is the interesting thing mm -hmm. now he's fully committed to his solo thing. Mm -hmm. But at the time, he was in Crosby, Stills, and Nash, so mm -hmm. like, they were that was still his gig. Mm -hmm. So this was kind of in between his gigs. So that was one of those things where we toured in between mm -hmm. other tours. And, and so, so, what kind of venues are you doing? We did we did some residency gigs, which were really interesting. So we went back to New York. We did like three dates at the City Winery, mm -hmm. and then we played on Fallon, which was the total highlight of that whole thing for me. It was so fun. Then we went to Washington, D.C., and we had another series of gigs at the Wolf Trap, which they have an indoor venue there. Um, everyone got really sick. 
got a really bad flu, which actually turned out to be a good thing because, you know, Crosby came back and he his heart was blocked, you know, so he had to get he had to right, you know, get that. get that whole thing figured out. Mm-hmm. But if he you know, it was a good thing that he got sick basically. So we did that and then we had to make up other gigs and then we had five nights at the Troubadour here. Mm-hmm. That was really fun. So, you know, it was it was a blast. We had a really good time. So. And are you having, are you, are you getting a sense of, because he's had reported mm-hmm. difficulties with a lot of people and burned oh, yeah. a lot of bridges, are you, um, are you bearing witness to any of that, or is that not the person that you're touring you know, with so much? I mean, he, he would, he would admit to you that every day is different, you know, you have to see the film, of course, that my, my brother did this film. Okay, so, so. let's talk about the film a little okay, bit. Okay, so the next segue is... <laughs> As we were working in the studio, my brother came in to shoot a number of And your of brother's things. name is? AJ. Okay. AJ Eaton. Mm-hmm. He's my brother's, you know, he's a director, producer. What, so what has guy. he done prior to the... He's the done husband. a lot of production on films. He's done a lot of commercial work. Mm-hmm. Um, he's, I mean, he's kind had of... Had he produced, his, has he, had he directed a documentary before? He'd never, he never done, he'd worked on documentaries of other people's, mm-hmm. like in a production sense, and mm-hmm. he's also an editor, he's a really good editor, so he, yes, he's done that work on the other side of things. Right. But, of course, his goal is to direct, mm-hmm. you know, that's always been his goal, and produce. So, this kind of came up where I said, hey, Crosby, why aren't we filming this in the studio, because we should be filming this. And he's like, we don't have any money to do that shit, you know? <laughs> and I said, well, I know somebody that'll film. And he's like, really, who? And I said, my brother. Oh, yeah? Is he any good? And I was like, yeah, he's really good. Just, you know, we grew up in a recording studio, so we, we have etiquette, you know? Like, he could be in here filming, and you wouldn't know he's here, you know? It's not like, oh, hey, man, you know? Like, he's not going to get in the way of the production. Mm-hmm. So he came up and just killed it. I mean, he filmed these vignettes and then he interviewed Crosby. Mm-hmm. Those became advertisements basically for the Cros album. They're amazing. They're in black and white. They're beautiful. you know. Mm-hmm. And he showed those to a few people and long story short, my brother's very ambitious mm-hmm. and he connected with a woman named Jill Mazursky and he told her Any that, relation to Paul? Yes. It's her, his daughter. Okay. You know? And so she she's a big supporter of my brother's and mm-hmm. they've known each other for a while. And he just said, hey, you know, I'm really interested in doing this documentary on Crosby. Because I was sort of planting the seed early on. I was like, Crosby, you should make a documentary about this album. And and then it kind of turned into like, well, you should just make a documentary, period. <laughs> and so he was Remember saying, my name, David Crosby, remember my name. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he was kind of like, well, we've had people approach us before. But, you know, it has to be the right person. You're opening up your whole life, you know, right. to them. So, yeah. Sorry, question. How is he about... How is he about all the truth being out there? Well, I think he's happy about it now mm-hmm. because I think it's his chance to set the record straight, you know. But you have to you have to see the film. But he's Absolutely. he's he's pretty much as honest. I've been trying to see the film. Yeah, I know. It's I know. hard to see the film. <laughs> I, I wanted to see the film. I know. So you'll be able to see it. It's coming out. Actually, it's coming out digitally soon. Oh, so nice. you'll be able to see it there too. Okay. I think it's coming out on iTunes pretty pretty soon. Mm-hmm. Um, it had a whole theatrical run and all that stuff. Anyway, so my brother approaches Jill. Jill says, oh, yeah, well, you know, it's interesting because Cameron Crowe's working here now, and he was working on Roadies. I should ask him. He's the biggest Crosby fan ever. Oh, and he's been God. interviewing him since he was, like, 13, right. right? So she asks him. He's totally game. He's like, really? I want to talk to this guy. So I, I was in on the first meeting. It was me and my brother and Jill and and uh, Cameron and That's it was pretty like surreal right there yeah and he's like wow and so he he got together with my brother and he's he didn't know how much time he could commit to it and he said let me let me do an interview and he did one interview and it was like he went so deep with him because he's known him forever and so as my brother says and he went to the interview and he's like the first question was so when did you lose your virginity and he, I mean, he went there. He just, that was the first question. I love that. Yeah, and he, so it got deep, it got really deep, really fast, mm-hmm. and it was just like they rolled, and that's what became the documentary. So it is deep, it's really good, and I mean, the Rotten Tomatoes, it's so, it, the high, the rating's so high. How high? I think it's 96% right that's now. That's pretty and, high. You know, Rolling Stone said it's one of the best rock docs of all time. Mm-hmm. So then the next full circle thing happened, which was that my brother's working on this. I'm at this point, you know, Crosby was kind of like putting different bands together and stuff. So I'm 
working on my other album, Versions of the Truth, and, and then this new one that I have called Invisible Lines. And basically, I, you know, at, the, at first I was telling my brother, man, if you, if you need score music, I know exactly what this should do, but you never know until the film's done. You don't know what it's going to look like, what it's going to sound like, what, how, how do you want people to feel? And it came full circle back to me to do this score. And so I did a lot of these really cool intimate acoustic Give us guitar. a little taste. Well, lots of space. Lots of there's lots of really it, it's it's so space it's so mm -hmm. spacious but it's really cool because it was like the whole thing is told from his perspective and it's really it's really just him narrating the thing so it's him looking outwards and so it needed to be something like he would write so it was really cool and then I Bill Lawrence this pianist from Snarky Puppy mm -hmm. you know Snarky Puppy mm -hmm. oh my god. Snarky Puppy is just one of the best. It sounds like something that I would like. Though. Oh God, they, they're just like. the sickest band ever. <laughs> really? Like, yeah, they're okay. Incredible. I'm gonna have to check them out. Do you know them, please? please? I do not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. After this, I'm gonna go on YouTube, and you guys will just be lost for a couple of days. But anyway, their pianist is just incredible. This guy named Bill Lawrence. He's from London, and he, we, we were gonna write the thing together. Like he's an incredible pianist. Mm -hmm. But what happened was we started working on stuff. Schedules kind of started pulling us apart because he's on tour. I'm on tour just doing different things But then we kind of realized just as the film got further forward that Sections kind of needed there's needed to be some jazz stuff. So he, he basically took that over and I did the, the guitar work mm -hmm. But man, it, he is just so fascinating and it was we did some really cool collaborations together I want to do more with him. Have you had so. you scored before? I, I have scored, I scored a dance film, <laughs> which is kind of, I know it sounds kind of funny, but my friends did this amazing dance film, but the thing was there was no music. Mm -hmm. And so it was up to me to interpret the film. And I put a lot of work into it. It was like a five minute film, which doesn't sound like a lot until you're writing the music. Mm -hmm. So I learned a lot doing that. And so I knew I was capable of doing it, but mm -hmm. I hadn't done a lot of score stuff. But you know, watched my dad score since I was a kid. What did and your dad score? He, he was scoring those films about birds of prey. Oh, right, right, right. That's back when uh -huh. it was actually film, and he was like playing along, writing stuff. And mm -hmm. he scored, you know, actually used to do a lot of commercials and stuff, like jingles and stuff, which is different, but it's mm -hmm. it's in the same vein in a sure. way. You know, you're trying, to, you're trying to decide on an emotion. And mm -hmm. So this was really great for me. It, it, it was fun. It was really fun, and it was a great way to be involved in me. I'm really grateful to my brother for asking me to do it, too, because... It was the right fit. I mean, I've spent enough time with Crosby. I know his tunings. I know his world. And it was just, it, it felt good. It well, felt right. Well, grateful to your brother, and I'm sure your, your brother is grateful to you. Yeah. He made that introduction. For so sure. Yeah. That was, worked out well. It did. It did. It was really great. So, yeah. And so, how did you get David to play on your... On my album? Uh -huh. Oh, I mean, he's, he's always game mm. to do that. He's like, man, I want to sing on that, you know? And uh, yeah, we'll do, I think we'll probably do more. You know, mm -hmm. we've been talking about writing some more stuff too, and we have to, because, you know, it's just, he's been, he's had a lot of a lot of interest in what he's doing. One of these guys from Snarky Puppy produced one of his albums called mm -hmm. Lighthouse, which mm -hmm. is really a great album. Mm -hmm. And so he, he really has jumped into a lot. And I, I mean, it's really cool, I have to say. The thing that I admire about him is that you look at a lot of artists, who are in their 60s, let's say, or just even their 50s. I mean, they've had a career. Mm -hmm. They don't really have that much to say anymore. Hmm. And or, and That's or. That's so sad. Well, or, I mean, success has its own thing where it's like, okay, you're really successful, so now what do you want to say to people, you mm -hmm. know? And I, I totally get that. And, you know, it's, it's a good problem to have, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But the point is, he has pushed himself so hard to do something totally new and totally progressive. And I mean, he's he's got killer bands. He's working with great young Jeff people. Jeff Pivar, I love you. Yeah. So I mean, he's just working with he's he's pushed himself, and that is 
really admirable. He's mm-hmm. 78. That's unbelievable. Years. Yeah. That's unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, he's... It's, it's crazy. Can so. you tell us anything about... I mean, I know the documentary is going to tell us a lot, but yeah. can you tell us anything... I, I mean, I read all the time that he's burned all his bridges. Uh-huh. Um, can you give us the cliff notes of that? Why? Or just how? Or Yeah, what is that? Well... I, I, th- I imagine it was the drugs for a long time. Yeah, I think there's some cumulative things, you know. Mm-hmm. It's just like 40 years of playing together, and I think you're bound to be on each other's nerves in general Mm -hmm. but then you know you pile that up with just doing really mean shit to each other and he Mm -hmm. you know he admits that everybody did that to each other Mm -hmm. all of them and he just said you know him more than anyone else I mean that's in the film Mm -hmm. so you know there's that Mm -hmm. and there's just things that it's really hard to get over that stuff you know Mm -hmm. and so I think does he have regret do you think um yeah he Mm -hmm. he says he has regret about all the time that he spent being smashed so is he, um, uh, I know he's sober, is he, mm-hmm. um, does he follow a program of recovery at all? I know he was following mm-hmm. the program, mm-hmm. but I think that, I think that his health has become his program mm-hmm. because, you know, he's got diabetes and he's got to maintain a regimen. So he can't go, he can't, is, can't do that. Is there, um, uh, has he made a, med- do you know, does he, mm-hmm. does he, would he like to Make amends. Mm-hmm. Make um, things right. Get back in graces. And I, I think it, it's a good question, and, mm-hmm. and the answer is I, I really don't know. Mm-hmm. I really don't know. You know, I, I just I know that I know all of those guys are stubborn, <laughs> mm. and I know that you know, and I also know just human human beings are. It's hard to let things go sometimes. You mm-hmm. know? So that's a lot of water under the bridge, though. Yeah, but you know, years. but the, the, it's like. All, all of them could probably, you know, the phone rings in, in every different direction, too. Yes. But, you know, yeah, somebody's got to take the torch up and just, just swallow their pride and try to do it. But I don't know who it's going to be. So. I, 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 my gut I says that one day we're going to see them together again. I just can't imagine that we won. He sa- Paul he's, Simon and Art Garfunkel could get he together says, again. He says, and they all say that yeah. if they, were, they would like to bond over what's happening politically. And he's like, if we could do something, like we could get together and do like a bring out the boats thing. So, you know, maybe, who knows? Ooh. That'd be cool. But, you know, it's, that, it's again, it's, it's interesting because I've dipped my toes into that world. Mm-hmm. I probably know too much about it now, but, you know, mm-hmm. the thing is I want to, you know, keep doing my thing and stay positive and, and not have any of those situations, basically. Wouldn't that yeah, be good? In my life. Although you had a little one with your drummer from the pad, right? You said you had a little baby oh, yeah. version oh, of yeah. that. We've, yeah, I've mm-hmm. had it. I've mm-hmm. had it with yeah, for sure. But that's music. So um, it's life. It's is life. What it is, I it's think. Life. Yeah. So so there's Italy in your in yeah. your life and and in your yeah. solo. So how did Italy happen for you? Italy happened. I first went over there with this guy Roy McAllister, mm-hmm. who made this guitar, and I'm you know forever. Why? Uh, he was part of a thing called the Acoustic Guitar Meeting, and mm-hmm. it happens in Sarzana, Sarzana, Italy. Beautiful Where is that? place. It is. Essentially, it's north of Pisa. Mm-hmm. Basically, on the it, coast there, um, close to the coast, mm-hmm. by La Spezia, mm-hmm. close to Cinque Terre, and uh, it's a wonderful place. But the thing was, it happens in a castle that was owned, or it was like a vacation home of the Medici family. So this castle, I I didn't know this. You know, he just said he just said you're gonna love it there. I said okay. I'm like, yeah, I'm half Italian. I should go, you know, and I knew that I had family what, there. Where, where's your family from? Well, interestingly enough, they're from like 20 minutes away. Oh, they're come on. To- Torre del Lago, which is really close. Really wow. close. So and what your family, you still have family there? Yeah, my cousins. Mm-hmm. I met them for the first time. Wow. You know, and it was one of the best experiences. You look about as Italian as, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was like one of the best experiences ever meeting those guys for the first time. Wow. And now we're, now we're really close. I love those mm. guys, but. What happened was we go there and it was a it's a performance but then there's all these rooms full of luthiers people that make guitars and it's like the only place in the world that this would happen and it's revered you know wow because people look at guitar makers and they're like oh my god that person's amazing you know one of the only places that really appreciates it Uh so that happened and i i just completely fell in love with Italy. I went to Florence and I was just like oh Oh, my god yeah there's nothing like no and I just was like 
I, I belong here. That's the, I think it's the first place I've ever been that I was like, I really actually belong here, you know? It's an interesting feeling. So that's another so, thing that you probably have been there before. Yeah, and, yeah. So I, anyway, so I just went back the next year, played the acoustic guitar meeting again. It was amazing because it's in this castle and I played the courtyard. And What's a castle like? Oh, it's like, it's beautiful. I just have to show it to you. It's called oh. the Forteza Ferma Fede. And it's like, you walk in and there's a moat. Oh. There's a moat area and you oh walk in. God. Yeah, you walk in over this bridge and you go in and, you know, they have, they have seats for about 500 or 600 people. And we played in this courtyard. I played out there. Then the next year I took my friend Kitch and we, man, it was just a blast. Was, what kind of people are you playing for? Besides uh, lo- local local uh-huh. people, uh-huh. people that are into guitars, people mm-hmm. that have traveled there from all over Europe to see these these amazing instruments and, and know about this thing. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, it's like kind of, of course, it's kind of a select group. Mm-hmm. Doesn't matter. They love music. Mm-hmm. They love it. So it was incredible. So went back the next year, and then I met another guy named Francesco that that has a little label there, and he he asked me if I wanted to release this album in Italy, and I was like, hell yeah, dude. That's all I want to do, you know? So he put out versions of the truth. This was like, let's see, how many years ago is this now? Maybe five years ago? He's like, yeah, we want to put this out, and he booked me this beautiful little fall tour that was three weeks, and it was a big jump. It was like me over there solo, by myself, riding trains, and I and just, how are the audiences for you in Italy? Oh, amazing. They're just amazing. I love them. I mean, they're just wonderful people. Do you speak any Italian? I do now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I speak Italian. I mean, I'm, I'm getting better, but it's still work, but I, I can communicate. And so it doesn't matter that the music is in English because music is music. And yeah, it, it, ki- it kind of does, it, mm-hmm. and, it, and regionally it depends, too. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're in Milan or Rome, it's a little bit different mm-hmm. than going to some of the smaller places, you know, where... Maybe the comprehension is not going to be as, as high, but you know it translates still. Mm-hmm. The, the emotion translates, so mm-hmm. that's what matters. So let's so. talk about you as an artist, oh. as another kind of artist. Oh man! T- tell about this. I'm gonna this. get really embarrassed now. Um, this is uh, have you seen the shot? that is something I've been working on for a while. I really have to, I really have to crack down on myself and finish it. But this is a painting that I'm working on in Venice. It's the photo that I took there about three years ago, and then I was back there about two weeks ago now, or a week and a half ago, and I, I found this same spot and took a new picture of it, but I love to paint. I've been painting since I was a kid. This is all acrylic, so it's coming together. I love the reflections in the water. It's, it's fantastic. Well, what is, uh, this, is, this is really, oh, yeah. got me very that's, much. That's a reflection of, there's, a, there's actually a planter up here. You can't uh-huh. see it yet because it's not there, but. There's a planter up here, and it's reflecting that. It looks like uh-huh. a little face. It does look like a face. I mean, I may have to take it out of there if it's too distracting. We'll, see. well it's um, where my eye goes. It, yeah. I totally am drawn to it every time okay. I look at the picture of the painting. Like, it looks like a little face. But it does look like a little it's face. In, it's in the picture. That's, it, it is there. But anyway, yeah. So, oh, look how much love your art's getting. Your art's oh, getting awesome. all kinds of... So, Pete, does anybody have a question? We have quite a few questions. Um, hang on, I'm just... Mm-hmm editing right now as we get them in. Okay. So Deslin Ross, who is from Cleveland, he is uh, 18. Okay. Seems to be connected with every rocker, knows everything at 18 years oh, old. Oh, sweet. So he wrote, I just joined Who Is He Talking About? And Paul said David Crosby. And uh-huh. Deslin said, that's funny. I guessed that when he said drugs in 78. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so nice. Deslin would like to know, uh, what yeah. advice do you have for a young guitarist? Um... Young guitars, man. You know the thing is, like, I. This is my thing. When when I grew up, it was like, you had to find a resource. Meaning that, you know, if you saw somebody do something, you have one chance to figure out what they're doing. You either watch them or you walk up to them. Hi, I'm Marcus. How did you do that? Can you show me that? Now it's like everybody's on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Everybody. So people are able to learn things that are, they, I mean, this is like the veil has been lifted off of everything. There's no secrets anymore, you know? Mm-hmm. If you want to learn, I could type up anything. You can name me any guitarist. I could find their technique right here. Wow. You know? So you, I mean, really, the, the, the sky's the limit. If you have something that you like, you can find it anywhere. Mm-hmm. However, however, I would say that the more that you can connect with people in the real world mm-hmm. that are doing something you like, the better. If you have somebody that you like, go go connect with them. Don't don't. I mean, yeah, okay, you can be a great guitarist, but you know, you learn 
stuff by sitting with people. Mm-hmm. You know, I the thing that I have kind of a pet peeve about right now is there's a lot of really good musicians that are just completely <coughs> like, you know, they're in their bedrooms and you're just going like, dude, you have no social skills. Mm-hmm. You don't know how to talk to people. You don't know how to entertain people. Yeah. You can't hold a conversation. Why do I want to play with you? Mm-hmm. Because this is a conversation that we're having. So, you know, like, it's not just all about, like, being becoming so skilled that you know that you can't talk with anybody like this is a this is a communication device that's that's what this is i'm translating emotion through music so i love that yeah so if you can connect with people go online learn all sorts of shit but you know connect with people and just keep playing and do what you love that's the other thing uh, uh, Sandra, Sandra D. Come on, you're not Sandra. D. Look at me. She, um, she thought that this was a photograph. Oh, that's which awesome. is pretty fabulous. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's super cool. More Pete? Yeah, uh, Polly Russ would like to know if you know how the Spin Doctors got their name. No, I, oh, it, Spin Doctors was. That's a that's a name from. Uh, it used to be somebody that used to spin the news or something. I can't. Oh really? Remember. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they were spin but doctors, this, right? Uh-huh. Yeah, I think it. There was. There is some someone called the spin doctor that used to. I can't remember what it was. It was like somebody that took. Oh, some one person, like a specific one. We have to look it up. Okay. Uh, yeah. Some quick comments. Yeah. Uh, is his dad single? No. Crystal, stop. <laughs> He's not single. Ken uh, said, uh, "Sexy Vicky Abelson." Oh yeah. dear. Uh, Robert uh, Grokoff, can you play one of? Cat Stevens songs on that great guitar. Oh, you know, I don't know any Cat Stevens Cat stuff. Ste- well, I mean, we, it's, we you know. To play, just... We want him to play Marcus Eaton. The guitar really can do anything that you, wherever you put your fingers, that's that's the question. <laughs> yes. <you know? laughs> uh, Paul uh, Lawson says, oh my God, I feel like I'm in high school with no one to dance with. Oh, I don't know. If that sounds like a sad comment. Hey, Pete, um, yeah. while we're talking to you, Pete, yeah. tell us what's up in Pete's world. I know you're leaving me next week. Crystal's going to come sit in on... on yeah, I'm leaving you next week for a show, but I have, uh, yeah, I got some stuff coming up, too, in November. The Grand Hotel in Vegas, they've asked oh, me to come back. Awesome. Nice. And then uh, a couple corporate shows in December in Pennsylvania. And You're um, leaving me for a really long time in December. I know, and an awesome awesome comedy club five shows in Erie it's one of the best oh, in the country nice they pack it and the best audiences and of course they want to buy tons of merchandise and great laughers so All do right. you have merchandise do you do the merch thing um I will have more soon I mean I actually right behind you let me show you something if you can reach back behind you see that big vinyl there I'll give you a sneak peek. This? Yep, right there. Yeah, I noticed this before. This is awesome. This is okay. I love vinyl no, no so one's, much. No one's seen this yet, so Ooh. this is a this is a this is my second time showing this. Show show there. Okay. This. Yeah. yeah. This is my new album. It's wow. called. It's called. What is it called? It's called Invisible Lines. Oh no! Wait a minute. It's it opens. Yeah, oh come I'll on! Show you. Stop. Let's. This see. is a full twelve-inch vinyl. Oh this my. Is, uh, there you go. Oh, oh that's very my. cool. Yeah. So it's got all the lyrics. Oh, I haven't seen anything like that in a really long yeah. time. So show show the other that. side. And this is the, this, these are the six six songs on the back. Very cool. Wow. And of course, you know the best part is that you got the, the vinyl in here. I, um, I need to roll a joint now. Yeah. I haven't rolled a joint in 20 years, oh, yeah. but I need to roll yeah. a joint. <laughs> <laughs> On this album, man. This is so cool because this is an anti-static Ooh. sleeve. Ooh, I love and it. Three songs on the back and three songs on side A, three songs on side B. And but how, this is really cool how this happened. Yeah. This is a company called Crosley. They make turntables. Mm. I'm give them a shout out, Crosley. These guys make turntables and they have a thing where they're helping independent artists get vinyl. So they they put up the, the money to help me print these. Wow. So which is really cool. So they're like you Rick know, Smoky and Quick yeah. Impressions. So right? I ha- so I can you know, I have to, I have to get them back. Um, but they're not you know, they're not like a label. They're not mm-hmm. like, Oh, we're gonna take a percentage. I just you know, so th- these guys are so cool for helping me do That's this. That's so wonderful. And this is a wonderful package. I mean this is so this is going up for pre order like really soon, as soon as I can get the video up and you'll be able to pre order this. And, How soon do you think? Uh, within three or four weeks. So around the time that you're doing yeah. Live and You Right, people yeah. may be able to do that. Probably okay. right, you know, maybe at the beginning of November. But I'm really mm-hmm. proud of this because the other thing is the quality is really high. It's a 45 it's RPM album, so the quality is even higher than you know your normal 33. 
it's beautiful. It's, it's we'll really just put this great. back here. Yeah. We're so it's, and, this and the photographer is amazing. So I mean, you know. Who's the photographer? Um, guy that lives here in LA named Andrew McPherson. He's done a lot of, probably you can tell he's a very high fashion photographer. I see that. But this is really cool, invisible mm -hmm. lines, and there's this. He put this in shadow here. Mm. He's conceptual. I like really that. Really cool. Um, really cool. <clears throat> so, any more questions, Pete? Uh, yeah, who are your favorite guitarists? Mm -hmm. um, there's a guy, well, Paco de Lucia, you know, he's a flamenco guy. You know, the guys that like... <laughs> or, you know... It's a little different on a still string, but I love that stuff. I so, love it. are you self-taught for that stuff? Did you? Yeah, yeah. I just I'm really into different styles, and I just try to learn as much as I can. You know, Paco de Lucia, the guy named Billy McLaughlin, mm -hmm. came through my small town of Pocatello when I was younger, and he's kind of like a protege of Michael Hedges, mm -hmm. which is another reason Crosby and I get along. But like all this finger tapping stuff. <laughs> Two-handed tapping stuff, you know. Very cool. So yeah. I, I love that stuff. I love Hendrix. I love. I, there's so many guys right now. That's the thing. There's so many. There's a guy named Eric Gales that plays blues. That is just like, oh my god, he's so badass, you know. There's a. Uh, you know, there's like all the Gary Clark Jr. stuff is really good, and Derek Trucks. Those are blues guys. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's just one there's, aspect there's, of what you yeah, do. Well, there's, just, I mean, there's just so many people to be into, you know, and so many. But I, I kind of look for somebody doing their own thing, and actually, what are you listening to now? I listen. Uh, let's see, what's what's new that I really like? Um, I, I, of course, I really love jazz stuff. You know, I really love like Brad Meldow and. I Pat Metheny, you know, Brad Meldow is an amazing pianist. I really love Bill Lawrence. He's the guy that I did the score with. He has some incredible music, the Snarky Puppy, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but, like, singer-songwriter-wise, I'm really into, um, there's this girl that I've been listening to that is a country singer. Uh, hang on one second. Slow burn. Casey Musgraves. Mm. She's badass. She's country, you know, mm -hmm. but... She's not really country, but she. It is. doesn't matter what genre is it if it's good. No, right? it's really good. And uh, and then I also I've been listening to. There's a guy in the UK that I've been listening to for a long time named Fink, F I N K. He mm -hmm. is so badass. Hmm. I love his music, and he's actually on tour in the U.S. right now. So. Do you like Ed Sheeran? Because there's definitely I, I love Ed an, Ed, there's <clears throat> yeah. a, a very Ed Sheeran. No, I, I love him. Similar. I mean, actually, it's funny because I I've been looping for a really long time. Mm -hmm. So when I saw him come out, you know, I started crying. It's like, that's what I'm doing. No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> but, uh, no, I love I love Ed Sheeran. Mm -hmm. I just, yeah, I'd love to work with him. I'd love to do some stuff. That, it's, that sounds to me like it's meant to be. That would like, be so gotta, fun. If he ever heard you, I think he'd want to meet oh, you. Oh, I, I just think it would be a blast. You know, mm -hmm. I think we'd have a lot of fun. I mean, he's, he's a really great writer, and he's doing something that's definitely more... I'm just going to say more commercial, you know. He's very commercial. Um, and that's great. Mm -hmm. I, I love what he does. I mean, I, my thing is I'm just, I'm developing my own style, and I have been for a long time, and so I, I just... Find How would you describe yourself as a singer songwriter? <laughs> this is funny. Somebody, I, I just call it, I call it progressive singer-songwriter, mm -hmm. but my friend told me, you're the Keith Jarrett of Ed Sheeran's. <laughs> does that make sense? You're like the Keith Jarrett of Ed Sheeran's. Of Ed Sheeran's. Yeah. I like it. Yeah, so I don't know. I don't know if that makes sense to anybody, but it's funny. So More, Pete? Uh, yeah, a couple things. Crystal says, fantastic show. I think I need a cigarette. Oh, wow. <laughs> she, I see. Crystal, you're giving us a lot of information. <laughs> and uh, Deslin Ross, again, he would uh, like to know. Oh, Tom uh, Petty. Yeah, Tom Petty. Uh, I love Tom time. Petty. I mean, I listened to him when I was younger. I, I didn't really, you know, I haven't really studied that I mean there are things that are kind of uh, there's music that's just kind of what would you call it I mean that's just sort of everywhere you know mm -hmm. um, there's a word that I'm looking for I just can't access it right now but it's 
there's music that's just everywhere and you enjoy it but you don't sometimes Pay you don't stop to, to think you don't mm -hmm. stop to think about it mm -hmm. you know I used to love like let's see what's <laughs> Steve, he's yeah. badass. Um, anyway, so you know, I love, uh, I love that stuff, but I didn't really. I was always pushing myself to challenge myself in a guitar it shows. scene because I just mm -hmm. there's stuff that I like. You know, I watched my dad play, and I watched a lot of people when I was younger, and everybody's doing that. <laughs> Okay. But I just it just didn't appeal to me. You have to sh you have to do please a moment of the strumming. All right, how did you meet Jeff Young? Oh, Jeff Jeff was at a I show at Room Five, mm -hmm. and uh, he was playing after me, and I played, and he was just he, Jeff is so cool because again he's one of those guys that's totally open minded, and he watched my set, and he's like that's really cool, you know I really like Jeff. By the way, has played uh, keyboard for Jackson Brown for twenty something years and has mm -hmm. a fantastic solo album out. Now, oh, yeah. and is an incredible artist in his own well, right. Well, he's played for everybody. And I mean, yes. he's played with Sting. He played, played with Sting. Tracy Chapman, mm -hmm. Alanis Morissette. Yeah, he's played with everybody. I mean, he's Donald, but, Fag Donald Fagan. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. you know, Jackson. I mean, yeah. for somebody to keep a gig like that mm -hmm. for that many years, you've got mm -hmm. to give a shit because yeah. those people. And he is. Use, yeah. yeah. So he you can guys bring met, it. How, yeah. how did you guys meet? No, so he just saw me play at Room 5, mm -hmm. and then I watched him play, and I was like, dude, this guy's awesome. He kind of reminds me of my dad in a lot of ways, because my dad plays like that. He's mm -hmm. really influenced by Ray Charles, my uh -huh. dad. So I have that influence. So I went, and Jeff said, come down to my studio, and he, you know, I played something that he really liked, and he's like, dude, I want to maybe have you on my album. And I said, okay. So I, I came back and played something, and then we've kind of been friends ever since. And then, and then subsequently, he's like, hey, man, you know, I'm going over to Germany for this tour. And he's like, I really need somebody that can play guitar and sing. And he's like, but I know that you have your own thing going on. And I said, well, I'd really love to do that. I mean, I, I'm always down to just try something and have mm -hmm. an adventure. And he said, well, um, I'll tell you what, you know, I, if you want, you can open, open the show solo. So I was like, totally. So we did like, we did 18 gigs in 21 days nice. all over Germany. It's, we just had a blast. We had a German bassist and a German drummer, and oh. I love that they're, they're my pals, and it was badass. So, you know, we spent a lot of time together. Scorpions on a Stick. Oh, right? yeah. yeah. That's a yeah. crazy ass song. I wanted yeah. Jeff to play it when he did Women Who Write but he couldn't do it without a band. Oh, yeah. But what a great song that is. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's, he's, he's very prolific. That was, that was after I was playing with him, which mm -hmm. wasn't that long. I'm just saying he's writing all the time. So wow. He's cool. So can you do a little bit of the strumming you did that 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 Oh, night? this that thing. That was crazy. We were playing a fortune teller. It was like... you to do that for so know, long. That's what all the girls say. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I, I don't know. I don't know. I've just, I've always really liked that, the, the reggae thing. And it's like a, it's like an extension. Some of that, some of that rhythm comes from listening to the police. And like some early Sting albums, there was an album. Actually, the one that Fragile was on, Nothing mm -hmm. Like the Sun. That That's my favorite Sting album. That's off of, what is the name of that song? History Will Teach Us Nothing. You know, history, yeah, teach us nothing. You know, so some of those rhythms, they've been following me around for a long time. But Are you a fan of Tommy Emmanuel? Yeah, I, I do I do love Tommy Emmanuel. And he's, he's wicked, man. He's yeah. so good. And uh, I've gotten to... I mean, I've, I've hung out with him twice. Once was in Italy, and another time was here at the Grammy Museum. And it's really cool. I mean, I really respect what he does. I'm not interested in doing what he does, yes. which is another reason I respect it, because that's 
all Chet Atkins stuff. And mm-hmm. I love that. I love what he's doing, but it's its own style. <clears throat> and as I've traveled around, a lot of, and especially in Italy, there's a lot of people doing that. Mm-hmm. A lot of people doing like the Travis picking. Mm-hmm. I mean, and that stuff's super cool, but it's not something that I'm really that interested in doing mm-hmm. myself. But the thing that I am interested in that he does, he just does these badass harmonics. Yeah. I don't know if you've and seen him do that. Too. Yeah, it's it's very cool. He's got a really cool style. But, you know, the thing is, like, this is an interesting thing. Like, I've really had to work to take an idea on mm-hmm. guitar, something that's maybe complex, put it into a song format, and make it, in, in, like, make it so that it's challenging and interesting to me, but then also make it simple enough Accessible. so people can listen to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's the challenge. And I think that, like, you can go crazy on the guitar and, and you can just lose your whole audience, you know? But I'm really interested in making songs that, that really touch people here. I was going to say that it's it's about the emotion that is... It doesn't matter what style you're playing. Or yeah. it, it's all what's coming out yeah. from inside, which you yeah. emote a lot of emotion in everything you. that you play. Thank you. I appreciate that. But, you know, it's all about that. It's all about this. And when I, you know, I was younger, you don't really... You're kind of... You're experimenting, and maybe you kind of maybe you just naturally hit people in mm-hmm. a certain way, or maybe they look at you and they go, oh, "Wow, that's really deep," and I love that. And I have one song. I'll I'll play it at the very end called Fiona. Mm-hmm. It's always been the most consistent, like basically the key to people's hearts mm-hmm. is that song. Always, it's always been, and I know why because it's it's just written from a really heartfelt point of view, and it's just it, it makes sense to me. But that's followed me my whole career now, which is really interesting. And so having those moments where you really connect with people is Mm -hmm. much more special than being like, look at this riff I can do. This is fucking badass, you know? And it's just, that's fun. It's fun to do that. It's fun to show people you can play. Those guitarists do absolutely nothing for me. Well, I don't care what you can do. It's cool every once in a while. But but I hear you. But but you know what I'm saying? Like, you're, you're playing. Well, if it's happening the whole time. But if you're playing and people don't know you can do that and mm. you throw it in there, it's like, holy well, shit. Well, that, yeah, and that's then, something, yes, that's but, something else. Yeah, but if you're like, if you're doing it the but whole if that's, time. But if that's all your, it's, your deal it is, is boring. yeah. You know, it's just like, There okay. are some very famous <clears throat> guitarists that that's all yeah. they are about. Yeah. Is it's the like, acrobatics. Oh, wow, you can play fast. Mm. And, I mean, that's cool. And, you know, I admire those guys because mm. they had to develop that skill. But I want something that's going to touch me here. Mm-hmm. I want songs and things that are going to touch me here. So... It's funny because my tastes are continually changing. You know? Who who touches you as a singer songwriter? Um, I mean, my dad always has had stuff that's touched me, so that's really cool. Uh, that sounds terrible. Who doesn't? No, no. I mean, <laughs> the way the way that I said, it. <laughs> my, my dad has had stuff that's always no, no, no. But his his music is always yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. But, but his music has always been really influential. But, you know, Crosby has some stuff that's mm-hmm. really that's really touched me. A few in particular that I... Like what? Oh, he has a song called At the Edge. Mm-hmm. And that's that's a very deep song. Of course, there's Sting, you know, because he's... I mean, he's, that guy's been writing great shit for so long. It's mm-hmm. just ridiculous, you know, actually. Uh, and then there's this Fink guy that I told you about that's amazing. Um, <clears throat> and... God, there's so many more. There's so many more. Okay, so when, when I start naming them, then I start blanking out because I, then I get yeah, of course. thinking about, oh, that one song. But there's a band called Mute Math that oh, yeah, I listen to. Them. Oh, my God. Really? They're, they write some killer songs. Yep. One of the best, one of my favorite bands of yep. all time. Me too. It's killer. So now, if, if you had, if you could write your story, yeah. what's left to your, what, what's something makes a billion dollars dot 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 the, the money no. yes <laughs> I, I, I've, I've been talking about the, the money is very important it's I'm very kidding. important though it, it is an important part but other than the money like it creatively yeah. artistically or or mm-hmm. financial what what is like what's more what's left you know, like what's something that is like is there something you're working towards oh is yeah it? oh yeah okay I mean one thing is that I I'm still I'm still looking for the thing you know mm-hmm. I mean I'm it's like I can look and see these things that I've done, but that's mm-hmm. not where I'm at now. Where mm-hmm. I'm at now is that I want to play for more people. Mm-hmm. I want to play for a lot more people. I want my music to reach more people. Mm-hmm. When this album comes out, I want it to really you know, hit the airwaves. Mm-hmm. I want people to hear it. And uh, it's special, and it's something that 
I think they need to hear. You mm-hmm. know, the album is it's Invisible Lines, but it's it's kind of a political piece in a way, but it's not overtly that way. But mm-hmm. it's just about connecting with people and how technology's erased all of the geographic boundaries that we have now. So, you know, it used to be like the government could say, oh, we're going to go bomb Afghanistan because nobody knows anybody in <laughs> Afghanistan. They don't know anything about it, you know? Oh, that's so sad. But I'm just saying now, mm-hmm. now that's different because mm-hmm. we do have connections there. We're all connected. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a great thing. The second something happens, somebody's got it on an iPhone and it's that's exactly all right. over the world. That's exactly right. And so, so in a way, I mean, part of that, you know, I don't like the invasion of privacy, but mm-hmm. what I'm saying is, these geographic boundaries, and, and this was this was actually written around the time of uh, Standing Rock. Mm-hmm. So Standing Rock was happening, and I saw that and was just like, this is incredible. You know, you have the Native Americans who are completely justified and are totally in the right fighting against the government. I mean, it was like, it was the, like the um, the small version of what's going on in the bigger scale. You know what I mean? It's like these people, they're totally right. They're mm-hmm. totally right. Mm-hmm. They, no one should be screwing with them at all. It's mm-hmm. their land, mm-hmm. and it's the progress. You know, it's like, oh no, we're gonna go drill for oil, mm-hmm. and we don't care about you. You mm-hmm. know. So that was the that was the inspiration the for mm-hmm. this song for Invisible Lines. And anyway, so I'm just saying, like, I, I have these. I, I want people to hear what I'm saying. I want to play for more people. I want to have a team around me so that I can actually get that out which I don't have I'd like to have a manager again Mm -hmm. somebody really positive and and somebody that you know communicates with people well Mm -hmm. and uh, you know and that I want to get all over the world and play for people you know so that's what I'm working for so what what is there a plan in place for when the album drops not really I mean there there's some plans Mm -hmm. I mean one thing is you know nowadays people are releasing things one at a time Mm -hmm. and the reason that they're doing that is because Spotify is so important Mm -hmm. We don't want to admit how important it is. But you don't make money from Spotify. No, but you... You get exposure from Spotify. But the thing is, you you get on playlists. Mm -hmm. And if you release songs one at a time, you have more opportunities to get on playlists. Mm -hmm. That's where we're at in the music industry. Interesting. And nobody can do that for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, there are some labels that can do some things for you. Mm -hmm. And I'm told... I'd love... There's a couple labels that I think would be perfect for this stuff, but they're not paying attention. Wait, who are they? Uh, one of them I'd Let's really like to work out. with is ATO. You know, that's Dave Matthews' mm-hmm. label. And they're really, they've are really they been releasing really interesting stuff for a long mm-hmm. time. But, you know, most of these labels are looking for people that already are just mm-hmm. so successful that mm-hmm. it's like they can't, they don't deny, have to do they the can't work. deny it. They mm-hmm. don't have to do any work. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's a little frustrating mm-hmm. because fame becomes the tool that tells people whether you're successful or not. And that's not how it is. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, but... I know so many people that are so badass and they're mm-hmm. never going to be famous mm-hmm. because they don't have the team or they don't have the that thing that's going to push them over the top. Do they deserve mm-hmm. it? Hell yeah, of mm-hmm. course they do. But, you know, there's just there's a lot of like real interesting situations that happen. And then there's people that rally around stuff that sucks. Mm-hmm. And you're going like, somebody believed in that, you know? And it's like, how did that happen? Mm-hmm. But that's the world, you know? That's the world we're in. So... Anyway, so I have a lot of goals that I'm working towards. But this thing with the Peregrine Fund, I'm really proud of. Next thing, I'm working with a company. I could show you this other guitar that I have, but it's called Guadagnieri. I, I should just show it to you. Okay. Can, actually, can you grab it? It's on the just right on the bed in there. Yep. We're in my apartment, so this yeah. is, you know, I can we're, just do what I want. Yeah, we're, 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 we're on location in yeah. Marcus's home, and, yeah. and uh, we're having a good time. So this is the next... <clears throat> I'm gonna grab that one or oh no that's okay. thank you because he's gonna play this that is, one this is this is actually uh, this is a thank guitar you, thank you man this is a guitar from a company that well I say company but it's a couple of friends of mine in Italy it's called Guaranieri Guaranieri Chitara yeah. and they made this is like a couple this this kid is 32 and his his wife is like 27 wow Alessio and Marta mm-hmm. and they made this guitar and it's this beautiful. thing is like one of the best oh, guitars wow. yeah it's got a sound port inside wow. but this is one of the best guitars I've ever played and they're and so we're working on a guitar together so they're nice. doing they're, we're, we're doing a model that's kind of like it's a wish list of things that I've had for a long time and you know th- this guitar is spectacular so it's not like 
I'm not cheating on you, baby. That's what I'm saying. It's, it's just what... Although that one was in your bed, so... Yeah, well, that's true. No, so what's happening is, you know, it's just, it's like, there, there's never going to be one guitar that's going to fulfill all of the things that right. you want it to do. Mm -hmm. And so you just have to try things. And so anyway, I've been talking with these guys, they're friends of mine. Unlike the woman that's in the bed, there's... Well, that's yeah, a right. story. Right. So anyway, it's really cool because we're working on this beautiful guitar together. It's not this one. This is mm -hmm. just one that I happen to have here right now. Mm -hmm. And this is a, this is actually for sale. This is on loan to me. But anyway, these guys are incredible makers, and I, I feel like super lucky because I mean, just when I wake up and think about all the good fortune I've had, I call it guitarma. You know, my guitar <laughs> karma. I wake up and I'm like, oh my god, because. You See, know, now I notice this one has the cutaway and this one doesn't. Like, yeah. you get in there. So oh, yeah. For you, I'm, I'm imagining I need that, a cutaway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the one mm -hmm. we're making together is a cutaway. It's mm -hmm. got the sound port. Mm -hmm. But we're doing something really interesting with the pickup system. I can't tell you what it is yet. Okay. But, but it's going to be pretty revolutionary if it works the way we want it to. Nice. And it'll just create a new, a new thing for acoustic guitarists. You know, something that we've all been looking for for a long time that we don't have, you know. So, so maybe you're going to end up yeah, it'll be like doing a new, stuff yeah. like that. Sure, being absolutely. an innovator. Why not? I mean, that's what that's what I'm here for. So, got to do cool shit. Make these so guys. let's. Uh, so I unless there's another pressing question, let's have. Uh, yeah. Do you have any upcoming dates? Um, there is a possibility, and I can't say this for sure yet, but uh, there are some Tim Reynolds dates coming up in mm -hmm. Southern California, mm -hmm. and there's a potential for me to be on a couple of these I don't know which ones yet so I'll let you know if that happens if those don't happen I'm gonna book something anyway so that you know so I can get some people out there I'll do something around well Marcus time. will be playing in my living room on October 29th on Tuesday he will be there I will be there Crystal will no doubt be there <laughs> and that's um, on October Tuesday October 29th um, we uh, open the doors at 11 a.m. we'll be live on the Facebook too so you can watch them out there, but if you are in, in Los Angeles, I suggest you get your ass to my living room and yeah. see us live. Yeah, that would um, be great. And uh, will you have other CDs to sell there? Yeah, I've got versions of The Truth, and I think I have some, uh, my other album called As If You Had Wings. It was the one before that, and uh, that's a cool album, too. That's a that's a pretty rock album. It's it's cool. I did a, a band or an album with a three piece band, an amazing drummer that lives here named Kevin Rogers. Mm -hmm. And he was like, yeah, he's he's a really incredible drummer. So the album is, it's, it's in Percussion's a way. Percussion's an important part of you. Well, it is. Mm -hmm. This one was like, it's big. It's mm -hmm. like a big rock album, but the nice. songs are really cool and it's, mm -hmm. it's intense. So. Mm -hmm. I'll bring some of those with me too. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Pete, thank you so much for doing that. I'm going to take us out yeah. with song. Thank you so much yes. for doing this, Pete. Absolutely. And um, for those of you out there, Tony Bronigal, a fantastic drummer, is going to be with us next week. Um, Lainey was, Kazan's been under the weather, but as soon as she's feeling better, I'm going to go to Connie Stevens' house and, and talk to Lainey. James Gatson, who was supposed to be here tonight, thank you oh, for yeah. stepping up. James Gatson, unbelievable awesome. drummer. His, his sister passed yeah. away, and so he went oh, back man. home to uh, yeah. to pay respects and do that. Um, there's a Terrence Blanchard, composer of almost all of Spike Lee's films, and oh, he's got a new one out good. now, Harriet, a film Harriet that just came out, oh, and yeah, Terrence is going to be with us uh, soon. And oh, um, Robert incredible. Wall, um, Arliss, is going to be with us on November 6th. We have some great stuff coming up. Also, on October 29th, Allie Willis, who wrote um, September, yeah. with Earth, Wind, and Fire, and she wrote oh the theme God. song to Friends, I'll Be There With You, and she's written uh, Boogie Wonderland. She's she's going to be there on um, October 29th. Yeah. Jody Siegel, an un do you know Jody? No. Unbelievable singer-songwriter who's worked with Steve Postel. Steve Postel just produced wow. her new album. She's going to be there on the 29th. Um, and um, I'm holding my breath waiting on Ray Parker Jr. I wrote him again oh, today. Nice. It's, his son's getting married like the day before, so... He's making us wait. And also, Anson Williams, Happy Days, oh um, is going to be with us on October 29th. So it's going to be wow. like a great. It's going to be a great day. Terrence Blanchard is so badass. He, he is unbelievable. I just saw him speak at BMI. Did you? It was amazing. Yeah. I saw him at a, a screening. What, what was so, the Spike Lee? So um, what was the Spike Lee film that I saw six times, Pete? That I took you to? That oh, we went to um, twice. Um, the one that it was that he Black just Black Klansman. Black Klansman. Did you see Black Klansman? No, not yet. Oh, um, and, and yeah. Terrence's score for Black Klansman <laughs> is... Uh, very yeah. rarely when I watch a film yeah. am I aware of the music. Yeah. 
I was always aware That's of the so music cool. in a good way though, in yeah, the best way. Right, His right. music is haunting. Oh, it's, he's, he's amazing. He's incredible. Yeah. So anyway, it's going to be uh, a lot of good stuff coming up. Yeah, Pete. Is Elliot Easton still on? So yeah. Elliot, uh, Elliot had uh, um, a little health thing too uh, okay. a few weeks ago, but Elliot said that you know he's. Um, and you know, Rick Ocasek, oh my God, you yeah. know, that's like a whole crazy thing. Um, but Elliot played, I used to run this club in the, in, uh, on Bleecker Street next to the Bitter End. And oh Elliot, yeah. And Elliot came in a wow. couple times and played and he's amazing. Yeah, that's great. Um, so that's I hope awesome. Elliot's going to be with us. That's, that's a big hope. Yeah. So, all right. So you're going to take us out with what, Marcus? This is a song called Fiona. This is my, <coughs> this you is the play one with this guitar. Yeah, I'll play it on this. Okay. Flavor. So tell us about this is on your new. And this is on, this no, is on this your, is one of my oh. oldest. This is one of my oldest songs. Okay. On what? It Where can you get it? <laughs> you can't get it right now. Oh. But okay. you can you can find it on YouTube. Okay. This is a one version on YouTube. But I'm gonna do another version of this. I promise. But this is like this has followed me around for years. So this is called Fiona. It's a love song. It's pretty self-explanatory. But. <laughs> Try to find it. Dark, she wake up by as my.
ships and sail I felt my soul begin to die If I never see you again Till the day she came to me She said I love you so much We sailed across the sea She said I Thank you, guys. Um, thank you so, so much cool. for doing thank this. You. Thank you. I am, so awesome. I am in awe of, oh. uh, of you. I am sitting here. Thanks for having me. You guys are amazing. Blown, Thanks for watching, too, everybody. Blown away. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you guys uh, next week. And um, I'm speechless. That doesn't happen. <laughs> see you soon. Thanks, guys. See ya. <laughs>